Yeah. So we are live on the custom. Okay, so maybe you can make me the the host. I think you can share share without. Oh, you can make me the sharer. Yeah. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. I did that. Oh well, I'll have to do that again, of course. Yes. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Uh, should I just begin then? Yes, I guess so. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to this PLDI uh, tutorial. Uh, the topic is the programming for autonomy and uh, it's been given by uh, Amit Chopra of uh, Lancaster University, who's also on the call, and and me. My name is Munender Singh. I'm a professor at uh, North Carolina State in uh, Raleigh, which is in the on the east coast of the U.S. So it's a bit early in the morning here. Let me uh, introduce the subject, and then Amit will uh, will take over in a short while from me. So. Um, what we're going to talk about today is programming uh, for autonomy from the perspective of multi-agent systems. And in, in particular, we when you say autonomy, we really do mean autonomy. So there are many approaches uh, in computer science that use the term autonomy, but then don't quite take it uh, seriously like, uh, like we show here. And our overall arg argument is that by not taking it seriously, they actually omit a lot of uh, important considerations of autonomy. So we'll talk about autonomy and systems uh, as a high level motivation. We'll talk about some constructs of how autonomy uh, can be expressed. And these are, we call them norms. They reflect uh, societal sorts of in indications. We'll talk about protocols where we get into how to computationally, uh, as in the, the spirit of distributed computing, you know, computationally realize interactions that uh, support autonomy. We'll talk about how pr uh, protocols are uh, realized in programming languages research uh, and offering a critique of you know what we need for uh, autonomy um, uh, as a basis for evaluating traditional approaches. Uh, we'll talk about how these notions of meaning, social meanings and protocols can be brought together in applications such as uh, you know blockchain, uh, such as uh, function as a service, you know cl uh, cloud, uh, computing kinds of applications uh, and the IoT. And then we'll conclude with the general discussion and uh, we hope there's a way for the audience to participate uh, as well. And along the way, um, there is a Slack channel that's, that's, uh, that's been set up. I think in a few minutes, maybe Amit will, uh, when he takes over from me, he can share the screen and show you the link for the Slack channel. I don't know if there's an easy, easier way for you to get to it. Perhaps you can get to it from the conference website. So the the notion of autonomy when it comes up in computer science today, uh, it comes from the sense of what's really a central technical entity. It's like people will say, you know, the software didn't, denied my loan or uh, the, the software, you know, um, gave me a, uh, a traffic ticket or made me uh, you know, send, send, if I'm, I'm a convict, it send me off to prison and so on. So the intuition there in, that, in those conversations is that the software is the autonomy, uh, is the entity that's autonomous. And in that sense, autonomy is really based on the idea that this works automatically and it appears complex. Uh, we, we generally repudiate this way of thinking. So what we think of instead is that we are looking in the situation of what you call a social technical system. So here there are uh, autonomous parties, which would be, we call them principles to mean things like people and organizations and so on. And these people interact with each other. And of course, each of them may be com you know, accompanied by various or supported by various tools, in this case, software. So, so it's, uh, uh, you know, 
you, me, Amit, the conference organizers, we are the principals, we are interacting with each other. Like uh, Amit and I said that we'll come and give this tutorial at this time, you registered for it, the, uh, the conference organizers did their bit. So these are the interactions that we have. And each of us could have been using software and in fact is using software uh, to carry it out, but the interactions are between us. So we are the parties who are autonomous. Like if I fail to show up, you know, you, you can't sue my calendar or, or anything with it. I'm the one who would be to blame. So here autonomy is a social construct. And roughly the, the simple idea is that anybody who's, a, who's autonomous can be held to account. So you can't hold a machine to account. And conversely, if somebody is accountable, then they must be autonomous. Otherwise it would not make, uh, make any sense. Um, and the other notion is that we know something is autonomous because it can be violated, right? So that's in fact the reason why you can and must uh, have a basis for accountability. So if something were not to be violated, then how would you uh, talk about accountability uh, in that connection? Now we, uh, being computer scientists, we flip that around. So we, we are not just interested in, you know, here we had principals talking to each other supported by software. So we're not just interested in that. We really have the software being more intelligent. So the software is talking to each other. So the, the software boxes are communicating with each other. Each of them is helping a principal. So on a day-to-day -day basis, then, you know, your agent is making a purchase from Amazon or uh, a booking of a flight, you know, when flights reopen uh, on American Airlines and that sort of a thing. Well, I should, I should clarify, flights are reopened, but just not commonly so. But in any case, uh, the agents could uh, interact with other agents and they would help principals. So in this case, the agents appear autonomous, but only, only insofar as the people behind them are autonomous. So if your um, agent gives money to me, then it's not the agent's money, it's really your money that, that is doing, is, is handing over. So we capture uh, that intuition. So in this page, in the previous page, the intuition is that there is an inherent decentralization. Uh, this is the traditional human base, you can say societal sort of decentralization. And this is our target. We want an equivalent notion of decentralization that applies for uh, software uh, entities as well. And this is what brings us into programming for autonomy. So uh, one element of autonomy is understanding the societal relationship. So we have this notion of norms which comes back from about a hundred years ago or so in, in this context, it refers to uh, norms as a basis for, for legal constructs. I think around the time, maybe a little later, this concept of norms expanded to be used as social norms or societal norms. And sometimes people think that norms have to be only the kind that are, uh, you know, like, um, like you should wear a necktie when you go to dinner or something of that nature. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, norms in the sense that we are looking at are the, these more regulative norms with the, we could say inspired more by uh, the legal literature. And indeed the earliest work on uh, deontic logics from the 1950s also uses norms uh, in this sense. So here we have an elementary norm, we call it a commitment. And uh, the idea with commitments in, in or other, just, like, just as with other norms is that they give us meaning of uh, in regards to the interactions between the participants. So for example, uh, Amazon might send you a price quote. You know, it may send it by just displaying it on its web page. Now, the meaning of the price quote in, in our way of thinking would be that it's a commitment. So they are saying, uh, if you if you make this payment, uh, depending on the on the merchant and the, and the nature of the transaction, they might be saying, make this payment within five days, then we'll deliver the item within 10 days. Um, Amazon might be saying that if you click, put it in your cart right now and click purchase and we'll deliver it within three days and we'll you know, bill you for it the day we ship it. Um, so so we, can, we can therefore assign meaning to these communications, meaning to these interactions based on this norm. So it doesn't really matter what data format is used or messaging uh, format is used or communication channels are used. What the essential idea is that the social relationship indicates that uh, one party has now committed to another party. And it's worth pointing out a, a, a thing here, where, I, where is that the, like in natural language, we can use this word uh, sometimes ambiguously and sometimes of course, even within the same kind of meaning with, with multiple defined meanings. So ob obviously whether it's five days or six days, I mean, that's the sort of thing that will vary from transaction to transaction. But there's one other difference. So 
if you go to the stock market, you can get a price quote. So you might, for example, get a price quote on shares of uh, IBM or Amazon and so on. Now there's a fundamental difference between the price quote you're getting in a, in a stock market than the price quote you get from a merchant. So the merchant is saying, I'll commit to providing you the goods at this price. Whereas on the stock market, they're not committing to selling you a share of Amazon or of IBM for whatever price is showing up. The price quote there is simply an indication that the most recent transaction that the uh, stock exchange knows of uh, took place at that price. So if they tell you, you know, IBM is selling for X dollars, that means uh, most recently it sold for X dollars. If you go to buy it, it will most likely not be X dollars, you know, it'll have moved up or down and depending on uh, other criteria. So so the meaning of this, the, the fact that it's the price quote is not in itself unambiguous. But the idea is that by having this notion formalized, so here we are written it in English, we're going to formalize it quite a bit for, as we go along. Uh, we can uh, talk about you know, who's complying with their commitments, to what they can be held to account. Uh, if you want to build an agent who will uh, comply with his commitments, <clears throat> you get an idea of how to do that because you know what those commitments are explicitly as opposed to having hidden them in some English, you know, uh, national language documentation. So here's a, uh, an example a representation of a commitment uh, in the approach that we'll talk about later. This is just, uh, just to whet your appetite. So the, the idea is that we are imagining some sort of uh, events of interest. So these are called base events. So uh, in this example, I'm using three base events, uh, one called uh, quote, one called price, uh, one called pay, I'm sorry, and one called deliver. So the, the, each event has uh, some fields in it, you know, some, some attributes that define it. So think of it just like a database table. So the quote table has a seller S, a buyer B, some transaction identifier ID, uh, some item specification called item and the price. So for example, if I'm the seller and you're the buyer, I could be, I could generate a price code of ID 17, which says I'll give you a black pencil for $1, right? So that's a quote event and it gets uh, logged somewhere. So we are going to talk about how, the, how that happens later, but you can imagine that, you know, when I send the price code, I'll, I'll log it. And when you receive the price code, you'll log it. So we don't necessarily need a central store, but we are going to work with the fiction that there may be a central store at least with this slide. And similarly, when the pay event occurs, you paid for this item, um, you would have paid uh, for the uh, the same transaction ID, you would have paid some amount, which uh, in general should equal or exceed the price. And you would have specified an address where the item has to be delivered. And when the delivery happens again for the same transaction ID, uh, it should uh, say that this item uh, got delivered to that address and the status might indicate that it was a successful delivery. So given all that, we can then express a commitment. And in this case, you know, the name of the commitment, just a label is called purchase, com purchase commitment is from the seller to the buyer. This commitment is created when the price quote is, the event is insta instantiated. Um, and then the commitment has two more parts uh, in this example. So the detached says that you know, it's when the commitment comes live, as it were. So when the commitment, you know, is called upon. So the price quote is just a, a quote is floating around, nothing's going on. But if you actually, you have to take some action which will bring the commitment into force. And what the detach is, it tells us uh, what that action should be. So in this case, the action is that you have to make a payment, uh, which should happen within five days of the quote, and you have to pay at least the price that was uh, uh, quoted in the, that was included in the quote itself. And then the discharge is how the, com how the commitment would be brought to an end, but to a happy completion. So in this case, uh, when the delivery event happens within 10 days of payment, that would be a, um, a discharge. So in a nominal sort of an action, action, I send you a price quote within, let's say two days, you send me a price, a payment of the right amount. A uh, couple of days later, I send you the delivery and we're both happy because the transaction, the commitment completed. Uh, if it should happen that you pay and I don't deliver, then you have grounds to complain. Uh, if I send you the price, if you send you the price quote, but you simply ignore it, you never pay. Well, the commitment just expires because you were never on the hook. You know, I was the one uh, who had sent you a price quote, you ignored it, and that's it. Now, the interesting thing is that we want to be able to operationalize these kinds of uh, norms via protocol. So, 
there's a information flow, right? So I have to send you a price quote. You have to receive it. Uh, you'll do something with it, maybe an action uh, that'll happen. That'll eventually be known, become known to me. So the messages, as it were, the communications will uh, will travel. So how will that work out? So those kinds of details are are crucial, and we work them out in a coherent manner with respect to uh, what's in this, uh, uh, what's specified in the commitment. And as a way of thinking, you can say that we can specify these interactions via uh, UML uh, sequence diagrams. So in the sequence diagram, what's going on is that we identify the swim lanes. So we say here, there's a, here's a buyer, here's a seller. The buyer sends an RFQ, which I didn't mention earlier to the seller. The seller generates the price quote, which is what creates the commitment. The buyer pays, which uh, detaches the commitment, the seller delivers, and the commitment is discharged. So this is one possible enactment. Now, the trouble with the UML uh, sequence diagrams is that they are informal. They're generally meant to be, uh, in, at least in this example, they're definitely uh, synchronous, meaning that, and that's how they're typically used in object-oriented programming, that you, you send this, uh, you make this event and you wait, you, you can't really proceed until, uh, sort of behind the scenes, the other party has you know, received that message. So, so when you send the price code, you know, and this, the computation waits until the price code has been received by the buyer. So, so underneath there may be some back and forth, some acknowledgements going on as well. Uh, we uh, will describe a de in detail an alternative language. This alternative language formalizes the notion of an interaction, but it does so without having any explicit control flow uh, construct. So it focuses instead on causality I mean, uh, of information, which means that if I'm sending you some information, either I must have produced it or I must have received it. I mean, that's the, the core intuition. And integrity, that there are some actions I could take which would be uh, violations of integrity. And therefore, you know, if I'm an agent, I shouldn't take them. And if there's a protocol here, uh, the protocol should be statically checked to make sure that it, uh, the agents in it can't take bad actions. And then there are alternative approaches, which you'll also discuss called session types. This is quite popular in the programming languages community recently, but we, turn, we noticed that it has uh, some major limitations. And there's also another approach, um, maybe an older approach in some ways called trace-based protocol languages, which are also uh, gained some attention uh, or recently. So these are also limited in terms of how they handle interaction. So the, uh, the thinking we have is that we're talking about an, uh, an interaction orientation. So we're talking about uh, separating what's inside the agent, the internal decision making of the agent from what the, how the interactions take place. So we, the way we imagine it is that at the bottom, there's some sort of a communication infrastructure. We assume it to be asynchronous uh, or assume it to be, um, you should say, don't assume it to be anything restricted. So all we're saying is if you send a message, you know, will it eventually arrive? And we can assume for now that it's reliable and that the messages eventually live, arrive, but that's not a uh, that's not a hard assumption of the of the approach. Um, the the at the heart of it, the what the agent is doing is decision making. So the agent is, uh, you know, there to make a decision. Like, you know, do I really want to buy this item? How do I want? To, how much do I want to pay for it? And so forth. Those kinds of things. The to facilitate that, we imagine two layers of abstraction. So one layer of abstractions uh, pertains to protocols, which maps the information that's being uh, communicated with information that's relevant from a business standpoint. So this would be take whatever bits are coming in and figure out that you know what's going on here is uh, a quote event or what's going on here is a payment event. And then the norm computer is assigning the meanings to those things. So no knowing that the quote has occurred uh, and knowing that the commitment creates a quote, it'll say, oh yeah, now there's a commitment that's been created. Or uh, knowing that a quote has occurred followed by a payment, it'll say, well, now uh, the commitment was created and attached. And if I'm the, uh, uh, the party responsible, which we call the debtor of the commitment, so I should, as a debtor, then be worrying about how to deliver on the commitment. So my decision-making would be focused on trying to deliver uh, the goods and discharge the commitment. Uh, another uh, assumption that a theme that comes up frequently in our discussion today is that of asynchronous communication. So the classical works on like actor programming from the 1970s by Hewitt and uh, 1980s by Hewitt, the work on um, 
the end-to-end -end argument of salsa, which was published in the 80s, but actually some of the ideas they referred to were by other people and going back to the 60s, like at the heart of the internet architecture. They all assume that you really want to not place in, uh, capabilities at a lower layer that you're going to have to repeat at a higher layer. And to us, and especially what it means is that there should be no message ordering guarantees. And yet I think current programming approaches are uh, so enamored of or so sold on this FIFO delivery that they try to assume uh, ordered message delivery because they think it makes their life easier. But actually we argue that it makes their life harder and just focuses them on uh, couples their code you know, from one agent to another agent or one uh, actor, as in Akka, for example, one actor to another, and complicates maintenance, complicates even the programming effort. So a much neater approach would, would dispense with this assumption and focus on the content that you're trying to achieve. And that's what you're going to describe later uh, as, as this tutorial proceeds. Uh, let me uh, stop here and turn it over to, uh, to Amit. Do I need to stop sharing, Amit? No, I think I can just take over. Okay, let's try. Screen. Just uh, almost done. I'm, I'm new to Zoom. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, my name is Amit Chopra, and I, I'm, I'm a senior lecturer at Lancaster University. So let, let me continue with uh, the tutorial. So, so, so you saw the underlying architecture in the previous slide which uh, emphasizes separates the decision-making of the agent from the components that uh, reason about the interaction. And our whole methodology, uh, the interaction-oriented methodology revolves around uh, declarative, lucid, high fidelity that sort of uh, model the real world computational abstractions for interactions among, among these autonomous parties. So there, there are two main uh, ideas that, that if you want to engineer a system, a social technical system, a system of autonomous parties, then you do so by composing declarative specifications of the interaction, specifications of norms and protocols. And you engineer the system strictly without considering how the agents are implemented, you know, what the agent designs or what the agent specifications are. You engineer the system simply by composing specifications of interactions. And then, of course, a specification of interaction, a protocol, for example, doesn't do anything by itself. It has to be enacted by endpoints, that is by the uh, agents. So when, you, when a party wants to engineer an agent to pl play its role in the protocol, it should be able to do so solely on the basis of the specifications of interaction. That is strictly without considering uh, other agents. If in the design of an agent, uh, uh, one had to consider the design of other agents, then those agents could become tightly coupled at the level of their implementations. And a principle of interaction orientation is that any coupling between the parties should be expressed in the specifications of their interactions. Any other coupling is forbidden. So let me switch to the next section. Uh, where, where we delve into the idea of norms as expressing meanings of the interactions. So you saw an example of commitments earlier, but there are other kinds of norms, such as uh, authorization, prohibition, and so on. So the general uh, ontology or, or the con uh, concepts uh, are shown on the slide that there is a social technical system which serves as the context for the parties who are the principals who are engaging uh, via the norms and via the protocols. And what, what, what the, the parties engage with each other on the basis of expectations. And some of these expectations have the form of norms. 
uh, each expectation has an expectee, somebody who expects, uh, some, somebody from whom another party has an expectation, which is the, uh, sorry, each, each, expect, each expectation has an expected and expectee. And in general, expectations are conditional. There is an antecedent and a consequent, just like you saw in the earlier example with commitments that if, if payment is made, then the goods will be delivered. So payment, think of payment like the antecedent and uh, shipment uh, delivery as the consequent. And so every norm is an expectation uh, between two principles. It's directed from, it's an expectation from the expector and to the expectee. And there are, there are several kinds of norms. Uh, there, are, there are commitments, the example of which you saw before, there are authorizations, for example, uh, for example, uh, I, I, I could be authorized in my institution to access some, some database. Uh, there are prohibitions. Uh, a, a nurse in a, in a hospital, in a healthcare setting may be prohibited from, from uh, d delivering certain kinds of medications to a patient. Uh, only the idea being that only a, only a physician or a doctor may do so. And then there is the notion of power. For, for example, uh, patients may have the power to give consent. Uh, so the idea, so if you elaborate a little bit upon that, the idea would be that the patient has the uh, power to authorize somebody else to uh, access the healthcare information. So there are all these kinds of norms. Uh, they, all of them are expectations and they, have a, they are generally conditional. So every norm specifies a directed expectation between, between roles and they specify the social architecture of an STS because that is the basis on which the engagements between the principles in an STS uh, pro progresses. And like you saw, there are four kinds of norms. In, in a commitment, uh, the expectee is known as the debtor and the expector is known as the creditor. The idea being that the debtor has to do something for the creditor to discharge the norm. And if you think in terms of accountability, then the accountable party is the debtor. So, so in, in the example that Muninda discussed earlier, that this well as seller commits that if payment is made, then goods will be delivered, then the debtor is the seller because the, it is the seller who has to discharge the commitment, who, who owes the commitment to, to the buyer. And the buyer would be the creditor here. So the buyer has the privilege of of that the expectation captures and the seller is the accountable party. Uh, in, in a prohibition such as uh, the example I gave where the nurse is prohibited from administering certain kinds of medications to patients, the prohibitor you could think of as the hospital or the healthcare setting and the prohibitee uh, is the nurse. So the nurse is the one who is accountable for the prohibition and the account is to be provided to the prohibitor who, who is the hospital. Then in the case of an authorization, it's more interesting. Normally, uh, you would think that if uh, a party was authorized for some action, then that, like for example, if I authorized to access a, a database, then, then I would be the accountable party, but that's, that wouldn't be the right way to think about it. Uh, when, an when, I'm when I'm given an authorization to do something, I'm the one, uh, who has the privilege, the party that gave me the authorization, that authorized me, is the one who is on the hook, who is accountable to me if, if that authorization doesn't work out, if I'm unable to access the database. And likewise for power, uh, the classic example goes all the way back to Austin's work where uh, the, the priest has the power to declare two people uh, married. And uh, then the notion of power is that by, by, by just simply by a declaration, you change the relationship between the parties. So it is, it has a subtle, it, it is not the same as an authorization. Authorization is more about uh, access to physical resources. Power is, uh, power is more in the social domain where you, by, by simply by saying something, you change the state of the world, uh, change the relationship between parties. And in the power, in a power like uh, in an uh, authorization, it is the party that has the power uh, that is the privileged party because a priest presumably has been empowered by the church to be able to declare two people uh, married. So if, if, if a priest were unable to do so, then it could ask for an account from the church by, by that, that is the case.
So norms, like Muninder alluded to earlier, have, have life cycles. Uh, you can think of a norm uh, being created uh, it, it, uh, and, and going through a, a certain other states depending on what happens. So here the figure shows the life cycle of a commitment. A commitment can be created like, for example, the quote event created the commitment in, in the example Muninder mentioned. Uh, a commitment, if the antecedent of the commitment holds, then it is detached. So if payment occurs, uh, if so the commitment is that uh, if, if payment occurs, then uh, the delivery will be done. So if payment occurs, which is the antecedent, then the commitment goes to state detached. If uh, from created, the consequent occurs. So if the commitment were created and the seller just shipped, uh, the, made the delivery without waiting for a payment, that's fine too. That's the transition from created to discharge directly. Uh, but you can also take the other path where payment occurs first, which is from created to detached. And then from when the commitments are detached, the seller's on the hook. And if, if the seller does the delivery, then uh, it goes from detached to discharged. So that's where the consequent is satisfied. If you're in the state detached, so the payment has been made, but uh, the delivery never happens, which is indicated by the transition from detached to violated, then the commitment goes to state violated. If the commitment were created but, but were never taken up by, by in, our, in our example, the buyer, then the commitment expires. So if the antecedent never comes about, the commitment expires. So, so you can, like, like uh, we alluded to earlier, you can think about operationalizing a commitment via protocol. So if you were to oper operationalize a commitment, uh, so the, so the for, for, for next few slides show certain operationalizations of commitments. And the questions are, are these, are these valid operationalizations in the sense, do they make sense? Uh, so, so think of the commitment as having a four place thing. A commitment has a debtor, uh, the creditor, an antecedent and a consequent. So the interaction diagram and the figure shows uh, two, two parties, debtor and creditor, and some interactions between them. The, Debtor first creates the commitment by sending a message. The creditor brings about the antecedent P, and then the debtor brings about the antecedent, uh, the, the consequent Q by sending a message. And this looks like a perfectly reasonable way to operation, operationalize the commitment uh, by, by messaging. Uh, but what about these other other kinds of uh, other operationalization? So, for example, could a commitment be discharged first and the detached be optional? So, so in this figure, the commitment is created, and then the debtor discharges the commitment by bringing about Q via some message, and uh, whether P happens or not, whether the creditor sends a message to make P happen, that is optional, and. Normally in a live tutorial, we sort of ask this question to the audience, uh, but here, let me just go ahead with the answer. So, so this is also perfectly legal because uh, detach, detaching a commitment, bringing about P is optional. So, so, for the, the, so in the commitment from the seller to buyer, if the seller says, you know, if you pay, uh, I'll deliver. If the buyer never pays, but the seller delivers, that's perfectly fine. It's up to the seller. It's the seller's autonomy in a sense that uh, he's, he's ex the seller's exercising by, by discharging the commitment even without a detach. And after that, if the seller sends a payment after, after the commitment is discharged, that's also fine. Again, it's this, it's, sorry, if the, the buyers, if the buyer sends the payment, that's also perfectly fine because that's the buyer's autonomy. So this is a valid oper operationalization of a commitment. Uh, How about this? Uh, uh, this? This figure shows a commitment where uh, it is created and it is detached. So the creditor brings about P via message. And then the uh, uh, bringing about the consequent Q is optional. So there may be a message that discharges the commitment. There may, be, there may not be a message. And this is also a fine operationalization because whether a commitment is discharged is up to the creditor. A creditor may send uh, a message uh, that brings about Q or it may not. If it does not, the commitment will of course have been violated, but that is exactly 
the autonomy of the debtor. So the debtor, uh, sorry, the of, of the debtor, yes. This, this slide shows another uh, uh, operationalization where the commitment is created by the creditor. So uh, it's, it's as if the buyer by sending a message to the seller is saying that if I pay you deliver. And you would think that is not a good operationalization because a party cannot commit in general, another party uh, to do something. Uh, that would be against the debtor's autonomy that somebody else could just commit it to doing something by, 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 by an action. So this, the, this would not be a valid operationalization of, of a commitment. And this slide shows how commitments may be strength, strengthened. So the debtor creates a commitment. The, when the creditor brings about P by sending a message, uh, the unconditional commitment holds from the debtor to the creditor that the, the commitment is now unconditional for bringing about Q. And when the debtor actually brings about Q, there is no active commitment and is discharged. So this is what you would normally expect to happen, but, and, and people tend to focus on this happy path where where the commitment is created, it is detached, and it is then discharged. But uh, there are other operationalizations possible as we saw, for example, where, where Q never happens. That's also a perfectly valid uh, interaction uh, for, for, uh, for, which, for the commitment. So, and, and all these uh, operationalization reflect the autonomy of the parties, interacting parties. So normally, uh, when uh, businesses want to track their commitments, you know, uh, uh, the, currently businesses uh, have databases in which they log uh, all their transactions. Now, if they have to extract what commitments they have to other parties, what orders are pending, uh, what commitments were fulfilled, and so on, what they'll have to do generally is extract this information from databases via via custom queries or whatever other methods they come up with. And, and it'll, be, it'll be very low level. So they'll, they'll, they'll be doing things directly against the information store to extract the relevant information. And these uh, queries can be quite complicated as we'll see. Uh, they, they're not very uh, easy to write. So what we've done is we've uh, come up with a language called uh, Cupid in which we can express the commitment and uh, the, the, this commitment can then be compiled into queries that can be run against the database. So, so you, if you look, look at the figure on the right, uh, which shows the Cupid approach, there is a traditional information store and we provide a layer, uh, a norm store, which is virtualized as norm queries that are, that are compiled from, from our specification. And then the agent can more easily uh, the, the agent developer can more easily uh, reason, uh, encode reasoning about the states of the commitments. So the way to do, so, so to enable this kind of a model, we've developed uh, uh, we, we, we've developed a language called Cupid, uh, which uh, Muninda described earlier a little bit. But the idea is that you describe the database. Uh, so here, here the database again is 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 a little more elaborate than the one Muninda. Sure, I showed earlier. Uh, it has a quote relation whose ID, whose key is ID. It has an accept relation with key ID. So, and a payment, shipment, and refund relation with different attributes. Uh, all of them have uh, the key ID. And then you can express over this database uh, a, a commitment specification. You can say discount quote is a commitment from the seller to buyer. It is created when a quote is a uh, quote event happens. And the Commitment is conditional in the sense that if accept happens within four days of court and payment happens within four days of court, where P price, if you look at look at payment, P price is an attribute within payment. So where P price happens to be 90% uh, of whatever is owed, depending on the quantity and so on, and the unit price, then the seller will discharge the commitment by doing a shipment within four days of the discount quote commitment being detached. So it's, 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 a, it's somewhat more complex than the example Melinda showed earlier, but it, it, it shows the kinds of things you can do in the language. You can uh, have sort of 
logical operators such as and or and a kind of uh, guarded negation as well. You can uh, in 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 it has uh, time intervals that the event that you can specify used to specify when the event should happen. It it can the commitment. Uh, states such as detached and so on, they themselves are events. And so you can refer to them in the specification uh, to, to like we did with the shipment that the shipment should happen within four days of the commitment being detached. So given a specification like this, what uh, you, you have uh, logical queries for the states of the commitments, the state, uh, and the states sort of capture the states you saw in the life cycle earlier that you can, there's a query for that gives you the created instances of this commitment, the detached instances, expired, discharged, and violated instances for the specification uh, shown on the earlier slide. And our implementation currently produces SQL. Uh, and the generated SQL is actually quite long and complicated, and it would be near impossible to write manually. So uh, the violated discount quote query in SQL is 413 lines long. I can, I can show you. Well, it won't be, I'll have to switch the screen, I think. Let me not do that. Um, so the violated discount quote is 413 lines long with many nested queries, sub queries and so on. Uh, and, and I don't think a programmer could write such a query easily by hand. And the five queries together for returning the created, detached, expired, discharged and violated instances, all of them, they amount to 1,060 lines. So from a five line specification, which is really what we added, if you think about it, this commitment specification is the, the database is already there in a traditional application, which is what the base events capture. What we added was the commitment on top of the database. So five lines uh, expanded to 1,060 lines of SQL. So it shows the power of abstraction in a language. Now, this, this slide shows uh, how, how this uh, uh, technique works, how, how the queries work. So like Manindra was saying, you imagine a database where events are getting logged. So this is a database where all the base events are getting logged, quote, accept, payment, and shipment. And discharged and violated are these sort of virtual views over, over the base events. So, so imagine that there is a quote, uh, there's a tuple in the quote table, which is, uh, T1, ID is T1, item is FIG, unit price one, and T uh, in all the tables refers to the timestamp when, when uh, this event happened. So this event happened on the 1st of June. Uh, there is another tuple T2, uh, item is pair, uh, unit price is one, and this also happened on the 1st of June. And they were, both these, uh, and then except happened for bo both these tuples, for both T1 and T2 and the quantity and the address was specified. And that happened on the 2nd of June. Uh, payment happened for both of these instances, uh, T1 and T2, the payment price was one, which is fine because uh, unit price was one and the quantity ordered was one. So the payment price uh, one, uh, that's what was made. And it happened on the 2nd of June. So accepted payment both happened on the 2nd of June and shipment happened uh, for T1 uh, on the 3rd of June. Now, if you're looking at this database on the 16th of June, uh, what you would infer is that T1 was discharged because, because our commitment said that a payment should happen within, sorry, a shipment should happen within four days of accept and payment happening, uh, which did happen. So accept and payment both happened on the second and the shipment happened on the third, which means within four days. So T1, the so there is a tuple in the discharge table, which is ID T1, and it was discharged on the 3rd of June when shipment happened. So, so this, this discharge is not, uh, uh, it's, it's just a view. It's, it's what the query computes that we produce. Uh, and if you think, if you likewise, if you think about the violated, uh, which commitments were violated, T2 would be violated. If you're looking at this database on the 16th of June, if that's what it had, then you would infer that T2 is violated because shipment did not happen. It should have happened within by the sixth, uh, within four days of payment and accept, but it didn't happen. So on the seventh, you uh, you infer that 
So you infer that uh, the, this uh, T2 uh, tuples or transaction was sort of violated on the 7th of June. So this sort of gives you, you an idea of how the approach works. You can write more interesting commitments. Uh, we showed you a commitment that was four lines long and generated 1060 lines of SQL. Uh, this commitment actually nests the other commitment. So uh, this is a compensation commitment which says that it's from the seller to the buyer. It is created upon a quote event. And it says that if discount quote is violated, then refund will be done within nine days of discount quote where the refund amount is uh, whatever payment was made. So if, if you were to, uh, so, th so this shows how commitments can be used to capture compensations uh, because nobody, nobody has to ever fulfill a commitment. So the, the, the best you can do is specify compensations and so on. So build a social structure around and this is what the compensation does, uh, which is what happens in real life as well. Now, if you were to compile this into SQL, it would be much, much longer than the SQL for this would in all be much, there would be more lines of SQL than the uh, discount code commitment because this nests the discount code commitment in the detached clause. But, 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 the, but, but the benefit of our approach is that no programmer has to write the SQL. The programmer focuses on writing the commitments and gets the SQL free from our compiler. So this shows, gives you an idea of the semantics in relational al algebra. For every base event, uh, E, you can think of the extension of E as the tuples in E, the materialized relation. And then the semantics, what it does is lifts the extension to all expressions. And a few are given below to illustrate the style. So if so, not, given that you know E, then you can compute the extension, given that you know how to compute the extension of E, E being a base event, then you can use that to compute the extension of E uh, between G and H. And that you do by simply selecting from tuples from the extension of E such that the, the timestamps on the, the, those tuples are less than equal to G and less than, uh, so sorry, but the timestamps are greater than equal to G and less than H. So you select in between G and H essentially, timestamps between G and H. Then if you wanted to do X and Y, what you do is uh, you have to select the X, Y pairs where both have occurred uh, and the timestamp of the composite event is the greater of the two. So the relational uh, algebra expression just captures that. And then you go on building, you write other, there are, there are other postulates, other definitions for or negation and so on. And then you come to the more interesting stuff where, uh, uh, such as when is a commitment? So th this D3 gives all the created uh, tuples. So CR, C refers to the create clause, R to the detach clause, U to the discharge clause in the specification. And so the tuples in created CRU are exactly the tuples in C because that captures the detached clause. And if you wanted to capture the tuples in violated CRU, then what you do is you take the tuples, uh, so that, that a commitment is violated when it has been created and detached, which is captured by the CNR, uh, but not discharged within the specified interval. So, so and not you should have happened. So the circle with the uh, line in between that captures the not. So let me uh, at this point switch. Uh, well, we can take a break, I think. That was the idea. Uh, Hey, yeah, maybe, maybe this can, is. Yeah. Or, I know. I thought we would take a break at nine, so maybe I can I can uh, launch into. Okay. Yeah. The protocols part. If you, for ten minutes, get a or twelve minutes. Let me see if, how how soon I can switch. Displays. Okay. What page am I going to? Thirty, right? Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Share screen. Do you see? Uh, yes. Sorry, trying to find the place. Here. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's me again. So, 
uh, this is a good time to uh, for us to begin talking about how to realize this notion of social meanings in a in a computational manner. And uh, you know, I alluded to earlier when I first spoke about the 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 idea that you could use a UML sequence diagram. And uh, Amit used a few of those diagrams as well just to illustrate the point. And they are indeed convenient that way as diagrams. But if you want to turn seriously, uh, you know, take a serious look and look at oops. Uh, Strange mousing. So, if you were to uh, take a, take a serious look at something, we need something a little bit more uh, crisp. And one motivation is that uh, traditional uh, specification. So here, I uh, you know this diagram shows just a couple of sequence diagrams, but of this slide shows a couple of sequence diagrams, but more or less the same thing will apply even for uh, approaches that are not diagrammatic as such. So uh, let's look at these two cases. So here in the, on the, the sequence diagram, the left shows three parties, A, B, and C. We are encoding that A sends a message M1 to B, and we are encoding that C sends a message uh, uh, M2 to B. Now, uh, in addition, what we want to capture is that M1 should occur before M2. So, so in many of these traditional approaches, they're trying to capture this uh, global perspective that uh, no matter where you... Uh, uh, make an observation in this whole uh, distributed system, message M1 precedes M2. Uh, it turns out, of course, that this, this thing is not uh, achievable without inserting additional messages to, to, uh, to restrict the control flow. So for example, you know, A1 could shoot off a message M1 because A1 has no idea of, of what C is doing and C1 could shoot off a message M2 because C has no idea of, of how what A is doing. And eventually, we don't know how those messages will land because it may turn out that the channel from A to B is slower than the channel from C to B or uh, A is, you know, and, and so on. So there's no there's no mechanism, there's no way of ensuring that this order is preserved. Now, and traditional approaches recognize that. This, this would be an example of an order that should not be, uh, that or a constraint that cannot be met. And similarly, on the right, we have two parties, A and B, and we just have two messages, you know, uh, M1 and M2 going in uh, the respective directions. And our global constraint is that exactly one of these should occur. And again, it turns out that this is impossible to uh, satisfy you know, without some side uh, business, you know, coordination or whatever, because you know, if A uh, decides to send a message, it's possible that B also decides to send a message. So the constraint is violated because both messages occur. But if A decides not to send a message, it's also possible that B decides not to send a message. And again, the constraint is satisfied because the constraint was that exactly one of these messages should occur. So, so what's going on is that uh, traditional approaches begin with this possibility of expressing you know, control flows across these parties and by capturing how the messages may flow. So they'll say, well, you know, this message precedes that message and this message is, is uh, must occur or not occur if the other one does. So they have these uh, constraints on ordering and occurrence and uh, exclusion is kind of like occurrence. And then they try to realize those constraints and they'll say, well, in some cases we can realize them in some cases you can't. Now the, uh, the approach that we take uh, is different. And our approach, you know, stepping back is that we are, we're not just interested in sending messages back and forth. What we're interested in is, um, what we're interested in is understanding how to compute the norm states. We're interested in how to make sure that the uh, the commitments and the powers and all of those high level constructs that are uh, crucial for autonomy, how they are computed in a, a natural manner going across these various parties. And to capture that, we recognize that what we really need is we need to make sure that the respective parties have the information they need like to, you know, to determine uh, what commitments or other norms are enforced. So for example, uh, if I'm committing to you, then you know you should know what I'm committing to. Like, did I commit to this item for that price or something else? And likewise, you want to make sure that you recognize, um, you know, if you take an action, like you make a payment, then that's relevant because that tells me uh, that you know you made the payment, and therefore now I better be working on you know delivering the goods. So that kind of so if you look at it otherwise, look at it in terms of the uh, the norms and how to carry on carry out sort of proper, like socially sensible kinds of computations, what we turn, it turns out is that what we need is uh, information to go in the appropriate ways. And our uh, idea, the key intuition here was that if you're talking about information, then that leads us very naturally to causality. You know, it's actually the, uh, you could think of it as the ancient notion of cookies, you know, which got even before the web 
came about, people had cookies, right? The idea here being that a cookie is an indicator of, um, uh, of some information that somebody can send to you only if some other event had previously happened. Like I send you a token and you send it back. But if you send me back the token, that means I must have sent you the token first, right? Because if I'm the I'm the one who could I'm the only one who could create that token. So so in a way, the ordering constraints just followed from this natural causality. We had to do nothing for it. We just had to specify it uh, with precision. And then the the notion of uh, integrity is a bit more tricky. It says that uh, you know, for example, that we are what we're looking at is some we're computing some overall social state. And we want to make sure that the databases of that that represent their social state uh, satisfy their you know th that their integrity. So we never end up in a situation where we can draw sort of opposite conclusions or inconsistent conclusions from the database. So we had to do some work for that. But once you do that, beyond that, there's no other need for uh, coordination. So you know we don't go around like we don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, you know, let me make this message precede that message. Of, and we don't wake up in the morning and say, let me make that message exclusive with the other message. So what happens is, if you want precedence, well, it, it it's because there's some information flow and that'll happen through causality. And if there's some exclusion, well, we do care because we only care about those exclusions where the lack of an exclusion would cause some integrity violation. So we do some, spend some time thinking about that. And then every other, constraint is simply irrelevant. So we call this the Zen of uh, distributed computing because uh, it's very calm. It just, you know, you put in the essentials and everything else uh, is obviously not essential and it doesn't make a difference. And the benefit is of course that you get much higher concurrency and you get much better support for autonomy because uh, one party has to wait for another only where, uh, you know, it's waiting for some essential information and that information is essential because we determined it to be essential for the uh, social state, but there's no other, it doesn't have to wait for or be constrained in any other way. And in that sense, we argue that it maximizes the autonomy of the parties. So here are some, uh, uh, some general points that I'll discuss. I'm going to talk about the formal language when you come back from the break, unless we will delay the break a little. Maybe we can go till uh, uh, another, I'll just finish this session, then take a break. Uh, all right, so we'll, let's let's work with that since Amit is on mute anyway, and I'm, I'll I'll change our plans. So the properties of the participants. So one is of course that the parties are at, uh, autonomous. The second is what we call myopia that the choices that a party makes must be local. So you can't, you, you know, when you when you make a choice, you can't be relying on information that other parties have. Like your choice, you know, can't be based on something that might happen. Uh, elsewhere in the system. And what it also means is uh, the correctness of what, any, any action you take can't rely on future interactions. So I can't say, uh, uh, let me, um, you know, let me uh, put some information, you know, using a data, the database intuition, you can't say, let me put this information uh, into the log and, you know, if everything, turn, it, everything may turn out well. Uh, because in this case, what you're trying to say is that we can't predict what the future will hold because, well, substantially because the other parties involved are autonomous. And of course, the infrastructure is you know, potentially unreliable, like messages may get lost and so on. So, so for example, you know, I can't assume that you will respond to my price code because you may decide not to respond to the price code or my price code message may, may die, it may never reach you to begin with. Uh, the other sort of uh, major intuition is that we distinguish between local and internal. So whatever communications are taking place, you think of them as public. So like if I'm, if I sent you a message with a price code, then the item and the price quoted are public in that sense. They're shared between you and me. Now, local is a projection of the public in this sense. So local is the, is that the local state is that when I send you the price code, I know that I sent you the, <clears throat> the price code. So I'll say, you know, here's an, you know, here's the, the black pencil and the price I'm offering is $1. Now, at the same time, I could have an internal state. In my internal state, I could say, oh yeah, you know, that black pencil is pretty horrible and it's actually worth only one cent. So I'm charging, you know, I'm offering a hundred 
times higher price. But that I don't tell you that, right? That's just in my internal state. And similarly, when you receive the the price quote, you lay well, okay, you know, Munindra just committed to selling me a black pencil for a dollar. And you might be thinking, oh yeah, this black pencil is you know superb, it's like worth ten dollars. Uh, so you but you don't tell me that, right? So you may in, in this in this e-commerce setting the the difference between the internal and the local is exactly the profit that each party makes like the value gain you know like if i think it's worth a cent and i can sell it for a dollar i'm going to get, gain 99 cents if you think it's worth 10 dollars and you can buy it for a dollar you're going to gain 9 dollars so so that difference is exactly private because if you were to reveal that difference you know um, that would alter the game altogether so uh, but that's just an example. In, in general, there are other reasons for you know holding information uh, internal. It could be like actual reasons of uh, uh, you know like user privacy. There's a lot more that you know. Like uh, you know, you don't have to tell me your medical tell me tell me your medical history to buy a pencil from me. So that information never is never relevant. But it may have some bearing on it. You know, it, it may be that you have a certain medical condition, and the doctor said you know. Uh, take notes at night and you find it easier to take notes to the pencil and you say, let me buy a pencil so I can take notes. So your your motivations could be complex, but you don't have to reveal them uh, to participate effectively in a protocol. So in other words, to summarize, so the protocol is what's shared between the parties. Uh, there could be three parties or seven parties, all of them uh, uh, potentially can share the information. Of course, the information physically shared only by those to whom it's communicated by a message. And that part, you know, the sender's view, the receiver's view uh, of whatever's been shared is the local state. The uh, each party sender or receiver maintains some some knowledge on the side, uh, which motivates it to you know make a quote, accept, you know, or accept a quote. In the case of e-commerce, it motivates it to go seeking products, uh, it and and so forth. Uh, maybe it motivates it to do you know bad things, but those those in, that information stays internal. And nothing else is shared except what's local. And the idea is that the local state, you take a bit of a local state and you ship it off in the message to the other party. And that's that's how the interaction uh, proceeds. So uh, uh, I'll introduce this language. This is a wordy slide. I'm not going to go over it in detail. But essentially what we're talking about is a, is a protocol language. We call it blindingly simple because it has hardly any syntactic constructs. So it doesn't have any control constructs at all. It just has uh, the notion of a message schema. Uh, which is an atomic protocol, and then the idea that you can compose protocols into protocols. So that, that's all that's going on. And the information is expressed through parameters, but I'll, I'll illustrate that more effectively with uh, examples. So uh, one thing to remember is that, so the intuition behind, uh, behind this declarative way of thinking about protocols is that each protocol is computing some element of the social state. So if I and you are engaging in a in a purchase transaction for the black pencil, for example, uh, obviously you know I'm computing the price and I'm sending it to you, and you're computing you know whether you accept it, and you're computing the address where you want the the pencil to be delivered. So you're taking those actions, but at the same time, uh, you and I together are computing like this uh, imaginary, you could say, this uh, relation in the sky. You know this universal relation in which uh, what we are saying is there was a transaction ID 17. It was for a black pencil. It was for uh, $1. It was mailed to, you know, 123 uh, Elm Street uh, and and all of that. So all of that information is is what the, what the protocol is com computing. In other words, each row of that universal relation is what the protocol is computing because each row corresponds to one enactment of the protocol. And the notion of key is that it keeps those rows apart, right? So if we have a relation, everything, uh, every relation must have a key and the key just tells you uh, that the distinct entities are distinct. I mean, there's not, it just ensures uniqueness. And then there are these constructs in, out and nil, but I'll, I'll describe them better with an example. So I'm going to skip ahead, but I'll let the slides be here as, uh, as notes. And skipping ahead, so, so we can talk about a, this is an elementary kind of a protocol. So the protocol has a name. Uh, uh, so initiate is the name of the protocol. Each protocol has roles. You know, in this case, uh, buyer and seller two roles, and each pay, protocol has a has a parameter. So these are this is the table in the sky. 
So this protocol has an identifier key and an item. So it has two columns in that table. And the, the protocol, so this is the, the outline of the protocol, which we, which we mostly are concerned with. And then the implementation of the protocol is through these messages. In this case, it, well, in general, it's a bag of messages. In this case, the bag contains exactly one message. So the message is from buyer to seller, that's the arrow. The message is called RFQ, which is usually good documentation for understanding what it means. Uh, and we'll associate this with the uh, commitments and so on, but not, uh, not, uh, not in this module. And then the message involves sending the identifier. So this is the payload of the message and the item. So the message is sending, uh, so the, the buyer sends to the seller a message called RFQ, which contains the ID and the item. Now, um, uh, the, this table in the sky is actually in this case equals this table in the message. So the message is a table and because it has, uh, this protocol has, a, protocol has a single message uh, that's pretty straightforward. The message has just one, uh, uh, the, the message is one table, which is equal to the table of the protocol. The, every table has a key. So in this case, the keys are, are identical between the two of them because they have the same table kind of, uh, you know, conceptually. So the identifier is the key. So I could generate many transaction identifiers. Uh, each of them could have, would have an item. The, uh, uh, if, I, if I send you two messages with the same identifier, they must have the same item. Otherwise the key would be broken. Similarly, if they're two in, you know, it sort of doesn't even make sense. So there's only, only one uh, enactment with every ID and there's only one logical message with every ID, although I could physically copy them as, as often as I like. Okay, the next point here, that's uh, in fact the one of the subtle points of the language is, is this. So we call it an adornment. So adornment here is uh, in all of these things, the adornment is out. We'll talk about other examples later. So what the out means is that this is the binding for this parameter is computed uh, by the sender at the time that the param that the parameter binding is used. So in other words, uh, let's look at this RFQ here. So when the buyer sends the uh, request for quotes to the seller, at that point, the buyer computes the transaction ID and at this, that time, the buyer determines what item. So you'll say, you know, like if you're sending me a, an RFQ, you'll say, here's transaction ID 17 and the I'm looking for a black pencil. So for example, so that would be, that's something that you're creating. So in other words, the out means that that is when this information enters the local, your local state because you sent it and eventually my local state because I receive it, but uh, especially your local state, it enters your local state as the sender uh, exactly at the time that you generate the message. For the receiver, it's a bit trickier. There's, there's subtleties that maybe I received this information through some longer path already. I mean, that can happen because the messages and the, the channels are not ordered and so forth. So let's not worry about that for the moment. But the send, the crucial thing is that the sender uh, creates this information at that time. So you could have previously, you could, you already knew, you know, what items you wanted. That would be in, have been in your internal state and that's never visible to anybody, but you decided to place it in the local state. That's what the out indicates. Uh, and here's an illustration of it. Uh, the, uh, I, I, each, so when you operationalize it, we can imagine that there's a physical table on the center side for this message. There's a physical table on the receiver side for this message. So every every message will have two tables. You know, one copy of it being on the sender of the message, one on the receiver. And this, uh, and of course, in general, uh, there will be more columns and so forth. Uh, in addition, there is the virtual table. This is the table in the sky which corresponds to the protocol as a whole. So that has the same name as, as this. So when you start out, you know, when, but just by writing this protocol, we have essentially created three schemas, the one for the sender of the message, one for the receiver of the message, one for the protocol in the, uh, the table in the sky. Uh, the messages when they start off, so the item uh, in this example is a fig and not a pencil. So the buyer add this item, uh, ID and item to its message, when it, to its table when it sends out the message. Immediately the message is in the virtual table, of course, because this is just a virtual table, it's just math mathematical construct it's not uh, represented anywhere but the physical message uh, has gone out it sends a second physical message uh, id5 a jam which immediately gets added to the to the table up in the, the sky 
and eventually the messages start arriving. So in this case, the first message didn't arrive, but the second message has arrived at the uh, seller. The uh, the message contains the ID five and the item jams is the same message, but now because it physically arrived, we have added it to the seller. So the seller doesn't know about it until the message, you know, sort of knocks at it at, at, at its door and it has in this case. And uh, this, this slide simply illustrates that because the ID one has been used for fig, you can't create another item, another message with the same ID, but a different content, you know, so that's, that would be a violation of the integrity, and we would uh, we would capture it at the agent. So this this kind of violation would be captured right here. Uh, the tricky situation of where the violations are not detected by the senders, we'll we'll talk about that later. Um, of course, you can have multiple IDs with the same content because they, it's a functional dependency. It goes from you know as long as these are distinct, these can be anything. Uh, here's the protocol that's a little uh, more elaborate. So this protocol is an offer protocol. It begins with an RFQ like before, but in addition, it has a price. So now there's a, it has a second message. So in the second message, the seller goes to the buyer. The message is called price code. It involves the transaction ID, the item, and the price. Now notice that the, the seller, like I mentioned earlier, the seller may have imagined, you know, what the internal sort of good price could be. I mean, could may think, oh yeah, you know, this thing is, has a value of only one cent or, or, the, or, or a cost of only one cent, but the price is what it puts out into the world. So the price is what's in the message. So at that point, it put in the price of $1 uh, in, in my previous example. Now, so that's, that price gets added the same way the item was added and the ID was added by the buyer. But notice here, we don't want the seller to start a new transaction. We want the seller to add to the same transaction that the, the buyer started. So in this case, the, the, the seller reuses the ID. So the seller is doing an N. What the N means is the ID must have arrived from somewhere else. The item must have arrived corresponding to that ID from somewhere else, but the price is being created afresh. And because now we, in this protocol, now there are two messages, uh, namely RFQ and code. That means uh, there are two tables on each side, RFQ and code. The table at the top is this one. So now it has three columns. So it's kind of like you can imagine it as being the the join of all the tables in the in the protocol, but it's only virtual. So it's not never never stored. It's just a mathematical construct to help us uh, think about what we're trying to do. So in this case again, the buyer begins sends of a fig price code. It has already landed um, an RFQ, and the RFQ has already landed here. The the seller generates the price code with uh, $10 for a fig, which is a bit expensive, but uh, it does so. Um, eventually that message lands at the, uh, at the buyer. So now the buyer knows it's, it has a $10 offer. And, and of course, same as before, because it generated a, a, a one, uh, already the, the seller may want to generate a four, but, uh, but the, the, the challenge is that for the ID is an N and there is no prior message. So there's nothing in the RFQ or any other table. In this case, only two, but there's nothing in any table that tells it what the ID could be, right? So this, this is illegal because it's generating an identifier. It's not allowed to generate and it's generating everything else, you know, like the item as well, which is not allowed to generate. So these, these should have been known before, but they weren't. Okay, so that's now we come to a situation where we can talk about uh, the integrity violations. And let's say there's a simple notion. So we want to have a situation where the buyer may accept an offer or reject an offer. Maninder, uh, uh, yeah. should, when should we take a break? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I thought I would just finish and take it at uh, like 9.30 or 9.38 or something. Okay. Since, uh, yeah, you ended a little sooner, I thought I'd take advantage of that. So, uh, so the, uh, so the buyer has a choice of taking, uh, of sending an accept or a reject. Now what you want to make sure is, first of all, of course, that the accept is going to be in response to a code. So the accept should have the same ID as the code. It should have the same item as the code. It should have the same price as the code, which is, but it's a decision about that, right? So it's saying, 
yes accept or the decision has the the social force but also we want to make sure the accept and the reject are uh, mutually exclusive we can't have both an accept and reject in a well formed uh, social state so we we the way we capture it is turns out to be trivial we just have in this case it turns out that we the buyer has to out the decision here and the buyer has to out the decision there but by our semantics if one of those messages occurs then the out will get added to its table and uh, the appropriate table like the accept table or the reject table which means that the information will be known which means that the buyer cannot use the out anymore because the out will have this disabling effect uh, in that it can't be executed uh, twice and here's an illustration of it so in this case we have the rfq as before the 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 quote we are not showing the seller for just you know because there's not enough space on the slide um but the buyer has a quote the buyer has nothing in the accept nothing in the reject so the buyer sent an rfq received a quote uh the buyer accepted the offer and decided to put in a you know some uh, item here something into the decision so it got added to the accept table and it also got added to the virtual table you know in the sky at some point now if the buyer tries to also do a reject uh, is illegal because the decision field has already you know this parameter has already been bound so we know it's wrong because it's already bound we know it's sort of practically wrong because it's specifically it's known to the buyer it's very easy for us to uh, operationally ensure that a conflict between here and here will be captured uh, the more challenging case of a conflict between here and here without an out conflict here we'll we'll tackle later So now we have a situation where uh, we we have a more elaborate protocol. So we have an RFQ, a quote, and accept and a reject as before. But the idea is that in this case we have three parties: so buyer, a seller, and a shipper. When the uh, buyer accepts an offer to the uh, to the seller, the buyer supplies an address, um, and or the buyer, of course, can reject it, and everything is over. Uh, I'm going to simplify some things here, but uh, essentially. the seller can then go to the shipper and uh, give a ship command to the shipper it says you know take this id with this i given this i'm sorry take this item of this id and give it take it deliver it to this address the shipper can go to the actual address of the buyer and deliver the item at that address so when the shipper makes a delivery that's the outcome of this whole protocol we call it outcome just to indicate that it's an important uh parameter of the protocol the the transaction has ended happily the other way the transaction can end is if the reject happens so the buyer could just reject the uh, offer outright and the protocol is over so these two the outcome here and the outcome here they both end up in the top line of the protocol the field address we decide we don't care about it outside the realm of this execution so we list it as private i mean we we could in principle make everything public but private is a good way to encapsulate some information and similarly we want to capture that you know accept and reject both can't occur and this knowledge uh doesn't have to be it's not like uh, not like earth shake, shaking knowledge what matters really is the outcome so we don't make it visible to the upper, upper layer but uh accept and reject conflict because they both have the same uh, out parameter so we know that both of them won't occur however we also know that for the whole protocol to complete this bind you know all fields must be bound in particular either a reject must occur or deliver must occur well that's a good thing but now we have a we have a problem which is that the buyer is potentially sending the reject message and creating a value for outcome the shipper is doing the deliver message and creating a value for outcome and in that case now there are two parties and they are both creating a value for outcome and it's possible that therefore that these uh, parties will uh, will interfere that it's possible that they will uh, each party will be locally sound so imagine that the buyer is sound because it's putting in an outcome uh, but and the seller is sound because it's also putting is the only it has only one table with that outcome but they are not consistent overall because now that the table in the sky has two possible values right that one from the buyer and one from the uh from the shipper so we had to prevent that so that's the that's the check that we'll we'll talk about uh, shortly uh, one intuition i want to convey is that there are uh, information can be to be for the information to be sent by the 
sender. For the AM, it must already have it and it sends it, it continues to know it. So it's monotonically increasing. For the out, if it doesn't know something, it sends an out, it begins to know it. Uh, similarly, the receiver, you know, the messages are always enabled for the receiver. If it already knows something, then whether it's an in or an out or an ill has no effect, it continues to know it. If it doesn't know something, whether it has an in or an out, it still knows it, so it begins to know it, uh, regardless of the in or out. Now, just to complete the table, so we, if you think of this no and doesn't know possibility, there's one more transaction possible, which is doesn't know to doesn't know. And to, for that end, we introduce this construct called nil. And similarly, doesn't know to doesn't know, we introduce the contact called nil. Now, the transaction from no to doesn't know is impossible because uh, we are we are assuming that these, so the, the, the fact that these communications are immutable, that the tables are append only, right? So when you when you created an event, it's there forever. And the append only, the, the immutability has the benefit that uh, it makes us insensitive to, uh, to the order, right? If some event is known to the sender of a, like the sender of a message, uh, as long as the channels are reliable, the message will eventually land and therefore the other party will know it. And it'll, the, the, the information will still be valid because uh, whatever becomes known never fails to become known. I'm going to skip this ahead uh, a little. I think some of these subtleties will come to later. I want to, I'll come back to these later. I'm just going to reorder the slides a bit to finish one thought. Uh, I should have thought of it sooner. So, so imagine that we have a, a, an alternative to the purchase protocol. So in this alternative purchase protocol, uh, we ex allow um, that the sender can, ex can both accept and reject. Right, so that's an example uh, of something that's bad. It's not bad at the local level. It's not bad at the local level because accept and reject, we simply removed a conflict between them. So the uh, the buyer sends the accept message, which um, creates an address binding, but the address is not visible at the top. You know, it's not included. It could have been included, but in this case, it's not. The uh, buy buyer then goes on to send a reject message. It adds this outcome here. But the important thing is because the address has been sent by the buyer to the seller, the seller can propagate that address to the shipper by sending this message here. And once that information has gone to the shipper, the shipper is enabled to go make a delivery. And when the shipper makes a delivery, it sends an outcome. So as a result, there are two ways in which the outcome can be bound. One is the accept, the reject directly binds the outcome. The other is the accept provides the address, the address enables the outcome here. So we end up with now a protocol in which at the, the, the table in the sky, there are two bindings for outcome, one created by buyer and one created by shipper. So uh, another problem with the, pro with the protocol could be that we just failed to complete it. You know, like we omitted uh, something, uh, we omitted the ship message. So it's not possible for the for this message to ever occur because the shipper will never know what the item is, never know what the ID is or the address is and so on. So, so we can, we call this a, you know, we can identify these shipping violations. Uh, I'm sorry, the safe, two violations, safety violation is if the reject and the deliver both occur. The liveness violation is if the deliver simply cannot occur. So the way we address it is we understand uh, how this information can be causally constructed and we use that to build up a tree. So we say uh, in a causal model information, messages that are received must have been sent. We make sure that uh, before a message is sent, the in information took place. Uh, when the message is sent, the out takes place. Uh, from the receiver standpoint, the whatever the, you know, uh, for the receiver to know something, it must have been, it must have received a message with an out or an in. Uh, and we, we impose that uh, there's some information minimality and some technical assumptions like that. And based on that, then we can analyze these, these protocols and determine it. So that's the basis of the static checking. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on that very much. Let me now go back a couple of slides to uh, describe the Uh, some additional expressiveness of the language. So because we're talking about tables, it's possible for us to uh, rely on databases to structure our uh, computation. So for example, we mentioned a situation where, you know, uh, in the previous examples, there was a, uh, the key was a single item, uh, but it's possible to have a composite key that comprises two or more parameters. So in this case, 
we have a role vendor and a role subscriber, but the key is now a composite of the uh, policy ID and the claim ID. So when we do that, this has the advantage that we can create a policy which says any claim that refers to the policy will be supported, right? So in this case, uh, we can create, we can, we can allow a message. Let's say the policy has already been created somehow uh, in some other protocol. We can have a situation that when you generate a claim request, you take the end of the first part of the, the key and you do an out of the second part of the key. So in a way you're doing an iteration, right? For one, one particular key, you, uh, one particular policy, you can have an unbounded number of uh, claims. So this makes it like a standing, or, uh, standing order. It has its effect of, of iteration. So we can capture that quite naturally in the scheme. Uh, for each, each of these claims, there'll be a response and we know it's a response for the claim because the claim is in along with the, the policy being in. Uh, we have the situation of uh, what you call the, we can, we can talk about protocols in which, for example, the price could be determined by either party. We call this in-out polymorphism. So like in this case, the price is not specified, uh, doesn't have to come from uh, this protocol. It could come from the environment of the protocol. So the price is already known through some other mechanism, uh, like maybe uh, this, this is a bit of an artificial example, but uh, one can imagine that somebody says, um, the customer say, could say like, you know, what can I get for $3? Uh, or the customer could say, you know, what can I, you know, can I get this pencil for $3? You know, so there are variations of these interactions that we can imagine. And we can capture them by saying, by having multiple schemas of the same name. So the same message RFQ can have multiple schemas. In one of them, the price is supplied by the sender of the message. In the other one, the sender of the message doesn't have the price. Uh, similarly, the RFQ, the code can have multiple schemas. In one of them, the price was already known, which is the case corresponding to, the, uh, to this. If you receive a price, uh, you can send the price code based on that. Um, uh, and you can accept or reject the price code. So somebody can say, will you send me, sell me this pencil for Three dollars or something, something like that. Uh, the other one is that you just determine the price. Somebody says, "How much will you send me? Sell me this pencil for?" And the answer is three dollars. And uh, one more example, and I think maybe that then I'll uh, I'll stop for the session. So here is a situation where either the buyer or the seller could initiate the offer, and I think this was maybe similar to the example I gave earlier. The, the idea here is, the, the, the difference is that uh, as far as the protocol is concerned, it's clear. So the protocol is concerned that the price is being determined, but the price could be determined by uh, either party. So the buyer could say, so maybe this example will be actually simpler than the previous one. So the transaction has already been set, so we don't care how. The buyer can say, you know, I want this item or how much is the price for this item? And the seller could respond and say, for this item, the price is this much. Or the buyer could say, will you sell me this pencil for $3? And the buyer, the seller could say, yeah, this pencil, $3, yes. Right, so now it's a possibility that uh, either party could be setting the price, but, uh, but the buyer has the first control. The buyer chooses whether to set the price or to ask the other guy, the other guy then uh, responds accordingly. And as a last thought, the main thing is that we are, you know, the notion of control flow, it makes sense for within a single object. Uh, it doesn't make talk, sense to talk about control flows when the parties are autonomous because they are not masters and slaves of each other. Uh, but across parties, maybe the, in the notion of information flow is appropriate. So I think this is a good time uh, to take a break for 15 minutes, let's reconvene, or 17 minutes, let's reconvene at 45 minutes after the hour, wherever your local time zone is. And uh, uh, I think there must be a way for Amit to put this on pause somehow without uh, kicking everybody out. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop and turn it over to Amit. Uh, thank you very much. So, so let's uh, reconvene in 15 minutes. i not sure I know how to pause anything.
Yeah, we have one live attendee on the Zoom and the other attendees are through the stream, I guess. So we'll just put the, if you can't pause the stream, well, you can let it, let it run, but you can yeah, just pause this. Uh, but but in the in the meantime, if you have any questions, please uh, post them on uh, Slack. Or if, if uh, an attendee is on Zoom, uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions to stop us where you, where you have questions. Thanks.
Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. So let me resume uh, with, uh, with our tutorial. Uh, so the next topic on the agenda is how do uh, people in programming languages research uh, approach uh, the specification of protocols? And this has been a topic uh, that's fairly hot in, in the PL community. I, I gave a tutorial in Popple a couple of years ago uh, on, on, on the topic and that the notion of session types is uh, it, 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 it's quite a hot topic. So we look at how information protocols, the kinds of protocols you would specify in BSPL compare against uh, the protocols that you would spe specify using approaches such as session types. So let us uh, review uh, a protocol-based system architecture. This slide shows the ideal Amit, you're not sharing your slides yet. Oh, I'm not sharing my slides, uh, sorry. Mm. Yeah, so uh, is that, Munida, can you see the slides now? Uh, yeah, yeah, now they've been shared. Okay. Uh, yeah, so so let us review uh, an ideal sort of uh, an ideal protocol-based system architecture. So we have agents who are owned by who represent different principles and they're communi communicating via protocol. And what are the constraints that such an architecture should obey? And what are the assumptions uh, that we need to make about the environment? So the so. The first constraint is that the agent ensures the correctness of its emissions. And to ensure the correctness of its emissions, it needs nothing but its own local state, uh, uh, which is the history of its prior emissions and receptions. So uh, when Murinder was explaining uh, uh, protocols earlier, he, he mentioned each table materializes the relations corresponding to the message. Each agent uh, materializes the relations corresponding to the messages it observes and stores them uh, in those uh, tables. And that, that, that is the agent's local state. Uh, it represents the history of its prior emissions and receptions. And that is all the agent needs to ensure the correctness of its emissions. Uh, it needs neither future observations, nor the local states, nor the states of other agents, nor the state of the infrastructure for that matter. And the, the second constraint is more interesting. Uh, the reception of any message is correct whenever it happens provided it was emitted correctly. Uh, and uh, which, which, which really captures the notion of causality that if a message was emitted correctly, then it should uh, be received uh, correctly. Its reception must be correct whenever it happens. Uh, you, you cannot uh, say that a reception is correct if it happens in this order rel relative to other receptions and emissions by the agent. If you say that, then you're uh, really restricting uh, your architecture too much. Uh, and if you have one and two, that really gives us asynchrony that the emissions are non-blocking because the agent can ensure the correctness of its emissions locally, then it can emit a message anytime it wants without waiting to synchronize with the receiving party. And uh, two implies that receptions are non-deterministic. A message is received when the infrastructure delivers it, uh, whenever the infrastructure delivers it, uh, an agent never has to schedule a reception. And, and three means that, no, in particular three means that no audit delivery guarantee is ever needed from the infrastructure. If, if a reception is correct, whenever it happens, then, then you don't need the infrastructure to deliver a message in FIFO or causal or whatever other orders you can imagine. And the protocol is the complete operational specification of the system. Uh, you can think of messages as the sort of atomic operations that the agents are carrying out by, by communicating them. And the protocol specifies, by, by specifying the messages, by specifying the communication, the protocol specifies exactly the extent of the coupling between the agents. Any other communication uh, to uh, or synchronization that is not expressed uh, in the protocol is, is ruled out because the protocol is the basis on which they interoperate. So there shouldn't be hidden coupling between the agents. 
And the only assumption we make is, is a very sort of uh, straightforward one that the infrastructure delivers only sent messages. Uh, in particular, the infrastructure does not generate messages and, uh, and the infrastructure, that also means that the infrastructure does not corrupt, deliver corrupt messages. We, we take the assumption to imply that as well because a corrupt message is never sent. And if you think about the assumption that then we are not, we are not, we are not even saying that the infrastructure guarantees delivery. A message may be sent, but not be delivered. It's a, the assumption only says if a message is received, then it must have been sent. So with this architecture in our mind, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's look at the protocol languages that have been studied in, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in compute, computing research. And actually they've been studied in several communities in software engineering, in multi-agent systems, the communities from, uh, from where uh, Munindra and I come and in services and in programming languages. And uh, we are gonna focus on approaches in the programming languages community because those have the most traction these days. So we saw at some approaches for specifying protocols already, we saw looked at uh, UML, uh, interaction diagrams, and there are more formal sort of versions of UML, such as message sequence charts. And these are, proce these are procedural uh, abstraction uh, ways of encoding the interaction because they, they order the messages. And in the programming languages community, uh, Two, two kinds of approaches have been studied. There, are, there is the trace expressions based approach for specifying protocols uh, where I, th I think the, here the, uh, it is a more automata, auto, automata theoretic approach where you, you specify uh, protocols as some kind of uh, enhanced regular expression and then work out the enactment. So that's a trace expressions based. And the work we're gonna look here is by uh, Kastania et al. Kastania and Izani Chankalini and uh, uh, Padawani uh, in particular. And there is the other body of work which derives from work on process calcula. And this is session type space uh, approaches for specifying protocols. Uh, Honda et al. Uh, have, Honda uh, and uh, has, uh, et al. have, uh, and his collaborators have done uh, some influential work in this area. And, and Scribble, who is Honda's, uh, 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 in Yoshida, who is Honda's, uh, uh, who was Honda's collaborator. Honda, Honda passed away a few years ago. Uh, Yoshida has collaborated with Honda on session types and uh, she, she has, uh, she and her collaborators have come with a language called Scribble, which embodies the main ideas of the session type spaced approach. And there's of course, uh, the declarative information based approach of which BSPL is uh, the only example. There are extensions of BSPL that we have worked upon, but you can think of BSPL as the leading ex exemplar or the only exemplar of the information-based approach. So the, the, the thing is these uh, languages are highly uh, complicated. Uh, they have complex formalism, very different abstractions. Uh, the programming languages, approaches based on session types and trace, they, they, they express control flows, ordering of messages, whereas uh, BSPL expresses in, in information, is based upon information constraints. So how can we compare these very diverse languages uh, that make different assumptions about our infrastructure? Uh, Scribble, for example, assumes FIFO delivery and BSPL makes no such assumption. So what can you express in these languages uh, different languages, where, where do they differ? And so we undertook a study uh, of these languages based upon these criteria, which we think are fairly important. Uh, in fact, concurrency is uh, one of the primary motivations in the programming languages work uh, on, on protocols. So, so if you think about can a protocol express concurrent actions by different parties? So that is one of the uh, cri criteria, criteria we're gonna study. Asynchrony, how, how well a protocol language supports asynchrony? Does it require, is it fully asynchronous? Meaning can protocols in the language be enacted without assuming any ordering guarantees or does it, is it asynchronous but still requires some ordering guarantees? Like FIFO, for example, first in first out uh, message delivery. How well does a protocol, a product, how does, well does a protocol language 
uh, enable expressing the notion of an instance of a protocol. So with information protocols, you saw that uh, with BSPL that uh, a protocol computes and information it computes instances of information objects. And, and, and that is an important idea because uh, protocol is not meant to be enacted just one time. Uh, it's, it's a, it specifies a pattern of interactions that may be instantiated many times. And, and then in, uh, when, when a, uh, an instantiation happens, you want that within that instantiation, the messages are properly correlated and uh, satisfies integrity constraints. For example, that a parameter, uh, some information, some information as uh, designated by by the parameter doesn't have multiple values. So that would be a violation of integrity if it did. And extensibility, which uh, which is the idea that uh, does a protocol language uh, support the idea that an agent can be enacting multiple protocols at the same time and interleaving the messages from all those protocols. Uh, if, if a protocol language is such that uh, complying with one protocol rules out compliance with the other protocols, then it is not extensible. So in this, uh, uh, in this tutorial, we're mainly gonna focus on concurrency and asynchrony and some uh, very broad principles. Uh, instances and extensibility I have discussed, we've discussed in a paper that's up on archive. Uh, I can, I can, we can uh, share the URL uh, if, if somebody, if somebody is interested in reading about that. And an important thing is instances, in fact, is uh, necessary uh, to reason correctly about social meaning. So, for example, you want to say that if a commitment was created for the delivery of an item where the item was pencil, then that commitment cannot be discharged by the delivery of a water bottle. Uh, so if, if that were the case, uh, then that would, that, that such a, such, such a uh, enactment would ma make no sense from the commitment perspective. And because commitments are operationalized over information, uh, over protocols, therefore all this, uh, it is the protocol that has to, protocol enactment, uh, which has to ensure that if the binding was pen in, in, the, in the quote, then the binding remains pen in, in, in the delivery. And that would ensure that the commitment, if it was created for pen, it would be discharged for, for, for pen. So I, I forgot to mention that, but, uh, but, but instances which really refer to the idea of information uh, and its correlation and integrity is essential for being able to compute social meaning correctly. So what we're gonna do is, uh, look at some very elementary scenarios and see how the protocol languages uh, compare for on, on encoding of those scenarios. So this slide shows uh, uh, three enactments. And the question is, can you specify a protocol uh, that supports all these enactments? So the enactment A is that buyer sends a payment seller sends a shipment and then, sorry, a buyer sends a request following which seller sends a shipment, following which buyer sends a payment. Uh, the B enactment shows a payment first and then shipment. So it reverses the order of payment and shipment. And the C enactment shows concurrent payment and shipment. So unlike the earlier figures, no party is waiting for, well, let me not put it like that. Uh, in the earlier figures, uh, Buyer, but either buyer was waiting for shipment to arrive first to make the payment, or seller was waiting for the payment to arrive to make the shipment. And in the in in C, uh, after the buyer sends the request, the buyer can proceed to make the payment, and the seller can proceed to make the shipment, and uh, therefore they can be concurrent. So can can you specify a protocol that uh, that supports all of these enactments, a single protocol, and and BSPL, you, you can easily specify such a protocol. The way to do it would be, as the slide shows, the buyer sends a request to the seller, and in sending the request, it generates a binding for ID and item. Uh, the seller, to send a shipment, all it needs to know is a binding for the ID and item because they are in, and then it can produce a binding for shipped. So if the buyer, if the seller has received 
a request from the buyer, then it knows the binding of the IDN item and it can send the shipment. That's all it needs. It, it has a dependency upon knowing IDN item, which it gets to learn from request in this example, but it is not dependent upon anything payment produces. And the, likewise payment from the buyer to seller is dependent upon ID and item, uh, which the buyer will know once it has sent the request. Uh, and therefore it is, therefore it can go ahead and send a payment and sending the payment, it can produce a binding for paid. So, so, so all three enactments are supported. Uh, the concurrent enactment is supported because after both parties have observed request, they can go ahead with their respective ac actions, shipment and payment. Uh, the, the interaction in A is supported because here the buyer sends a request. Uh, here, the, in this example, the buyer will wait for to receive the shipment, which is allowed in this protocol, and then the buyer sends the payment. And enactment B is supported because uh, the enactment where seller waits to receive payment before sending shipment is also uh, supported in the, in the BSPL protocol. Now let's specify the same protocol in Scribble. Now Scribble is a procedural language. You specify a control flow of messages. Uh, below the BSPL protocol is the encoding in Scribble. So it specifies a protocol flexible purchase, uh, which has two roles, buyer and seller. The protocol begins with a request from the buyer to seller. The semicolon indicates sequencing. And so after the request, there's a choice at the buyer. Uh, either the buyer sends uh, payment uh, or, uh, or uh, and then receives shipment or there is, or, or, or the buyer receives a shipment and then sends payment. So the, this is what the protocol expresses. And you can already see the problem here that the choice is at B, but the action in, in, in the second, on, on the second part of the OR, in the lower part of the OR is an action from the seller to the buyer, which is not considered valid by Scribble. So if you look at what is happening is that in Scribble, a mix, a choice that is mixed, a choice where uh, between actions by different parties uh, is, is not allowed, between sending actions by different parties is not allowed. And this is what is happening. The choice is between payment from the buyer to seller. So this action is from the buyer or shipment first from the seller to buyer. Now, if we, of course, the, the, the more technical reason is that uh, the way Scribble works is it takes a projection of this uh, protocol for each of the parties. So the, the two projections are shown here. One for the top one is for the buyer and the bottom for the seller. Uh, and what is saying is that the buyer has an internal choice and the buyer's projection there's a choice at B, which means that the buyer decides what happens. Uh, either it decides to send payment to S or receive shipment from S. And in the seller's projection, uh, the, the seller has an external choice, meaning the choice is encoded at the buyer. So it's an external choice for the seller and the choice, uh, so it, it cannot choose. It has to wait for the buyer to choose. Essentially, that's what an external choice means. And the choice is either it can receive a payment from B or send a shipment to B. But of course, the, the seller cannot send a shipment to B because it's an external choice. So the buyer has to decide. Now, what happens if the buyer decides to receive a shipment from S, if it makes that choice, then there is, the system is uh, deadlocked because there is no way for the seller to know that the buyer has made that choice, save some hidden synchronization, but that is not allowed. And therefore this entire uh, system deadlocks and therefore the protocol uh, specified here is rejected as invalid. Now the same thing happens Although the languages look very different, Trace and Scribble, uh, the ideas behind them are largely very similar. So in Trace as well, it turns out that you cannot encode flexible purchase because it too does not allow mixed choice. It does not allow choice where, where the operands are initiated by actions from different parties. So here is how you would encode flexible purchase in, in Trace. So the buyer sends a request to the seller, uh, followed by the semicolon indicating sequencing, followed by uh, either, uh, followed by two, two, two things, payment from buyer to seller and seller from, and shipment from seller to buyer. The and indicates a shuffle. So these could happen in any order. That's what it's, it's saying, the protocol is saying. And if you take the projections, you give the external choice to one party and the internal choice. So 
to consistently with Scribble, we gave the ex inter internal choice to the buyer, which is indicated by the circle plus operator. So the, uh, you can actually see it more clearly in this exam, in this encoding that the seller, the buyer has uh, the choice of either receiving a shipment from the seller and then sending payment or receiving uh, or sending payment and then receiving shipment. But if it decides to receive shipment because it's the internal choice for the buyer, the seller will have no way the sell, because the seller has an external choice, the seller will have no way of uh, knowing that uh, that's the choice made by the buyer and the system will be deadlocked. So again, so again, this, this protocol is rejected in trace as well. So, so although you can encode flexible purchase concurrent actions in, uh, in BSPL, it is not possible to encode them in these other protocol languages. And I think that there are there are, there are good reasons for for uh, so we looked at the notion of safety in BSPL that uh, BSPL two rejects the idea that uh, an enactment could produce two bindings for the same parameter. Uh, now here here the, the enactments are producing different bindings. Shipment is producing a binding for shipped. And payment is producing a binding for paid, and therefore it's perfectly fine. But because Scribble and Trace they don't model information, they are unable to make the distinction between which choices are good and which choices are bad, or sufficiently make the distinction between good and bad choices. So another thing is uh, Scribble needs FIFO ordering from the infrastructure. So anything. Anytime you make an assumption of the infrastructure, that's a requirement you're placing on the environment, and therefore you 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 uh, you become the agents become tightly coupled via the environment. So they need that kind of environment to work, and they become coupled through the environment. So it's best to minimize assumptions uh, made of the environment. Now Scribble assumes FIFO ordering, BSPL as we saw doesn't, but let's dwell a little bit more into that. So here's a very simple example: a B wants but buyer wants some item and will pay some amount to s so it's a, a very uh, elementary maybe somewhat unrealistic example two messages being sent by the same party one after the other but it's possible to write a protocol like this why not so buyer sends want so there are two ways this interaction could go if you didn't have fifo so one is the buyer sends want and it is received by the seller and then the buyer sends will pay and it is received uh, or rather I should say want and will pay are received by the seller in the same order in which they're sent by the buyer. That's indicated in uh, enactment D. The numbering is a little screwed up. Uh, and the other enactment E shows what happens if you, if, uh, that, that, if you didn't have uh, FIFO delivery. So that it could happen that will pay gets first uh, to the seller and then want arrives. Now, in BSPL, you can express this protocol like this, uh, and it captures both the enactments in the earlier figure. So buyer sends want and to sell, and doing so, it produces ID and item. And once it knows the ID and item, it can sell bill pay and it produce uh, the price in doing so. Now, B BSPL does not say anything about when a message should be received. If they were sent correctly, then reception anytime they have they happen as uh, anytime a reception happens, it is correct. So it doesn't matter in which um, uh, order these messages are delivered to the seller. Whereas if you think, if you encode the same protocol in uh, Scribble, uh, the, the encoding is shown in, in below the BSPL encoding. So the want will be protocol has two roles, buyer and seller. There's a want message from buyer to seller followed by a will pay message from buyer to seller. Now, if you look at the projection of the seller in Scribble, well, what It'll look like this, that uh, the seller expects a want from buyer and then it expects a will pay from buyer. So it expects these messages, it expects want first and will pay first. And the way Scribble guarantees this will happen that the buyer, a seller will see the message in this order by assuming FIFO ordering. Because if it didn't assume FIFO, then it could very well be that will pay arrives. If will pay arrives first at the buyer, then this projection is not compatible with that such an ordering. So BSP uh, Scribble makes things work by ordering, assuming FIFO. But then you can you can ask another question. You know how far does FIFO go? 
it is well known that FIFO is inadequate, inadequate for settings of more than two parties because it's FIFO is obviously pairwise. So consider this scenario in an indirect payment purchase protocol after receiving an offer, uh, the buyer sends an accept to the seller and it sends an instruction to the bank to do a transfer to the seller, transfer of money to the seller. Now, if, if the figure F shows in order delivery, you know, this is the sort of path people imagine will, uh, this is how people imagine the enactment will go. You know, all things happen in order. So, so buyer receives, sees an offer, sends an accept, uh, then it sends uh, and instruction to the bank and the seller sees the transfer last from the bank. But if you had FIFO, the enactment in G could still obtain. Uh, so what, what happens here is at the seller, the transfer arrives before uh, the accept. And even if you had FIFO, this could happen because uh, they're, they're on different channels, you know, between the buyer and seller and between the seller and bank. Uh, so, so can you write a protocol that, that captures both these enactments? They're perfectly fine. I mean, uh, G is just the result of asynchrony. You know, messages arrive in different orders. So can you write a protocol that is compatible, that, that supports both these enactments? In, in BSPL, it's straightforward to do so. Again, uh, yeah, the, the, the reason being that BSPL does not constrain when an agent should see a message. Anytime is fine. Uh, so, so in BSPL, what you would say is uh, the seller sends an offer to the buyer. To send an accept, the buyer must have seen the offer because it needs the ID and item, uh, but it can send an accept then. And it, if it knows the ID, ID uh, price, and if it's sent an accept, it can also send an instruct to the bank. And when the bank receives the instruction, which uh, brings which uh, brings it knowledge of this parameter uh, of the binding of instance, it can send a transfer. So, so again, the main point is that accept, the reception of accept and transfer is not constrained. Both of which are received by the seller is not constrained by BSPL. But as if you look at the protocol as it is encoded in Scribble, uh, the encoding looks very simple uh, at first glance. You know, offer is from seller to buyer, then accept from buyer to seller, followed by instruct from buyer to bank, and transfer from bank to seller. By the way, the bank is represented as K. And if you take a projection at the seller, because that, that is where uh, the, the interesting ordering is happening, the projection of the seller will say that it expects an offer. Uh, well, it, it will send an offer to the bank then it expects an accept from the bank and then a transfer from K. Uh, now, uh, now again, so, so the uh, scribble, the projection for the seller is expecting to see an accept before a transfer. So you would think it will not be able to support uh, this enactment in G because here the transfer is arriving before the accept. Uh, and therefore the protocol should be ruled out as invalid because uh, it is incompatible with the observed orderings of events. Uh, but Scribble introduces a, a, a contortion. What it says is that, well, they're on different channels, you know, accept is from the bank and transfer is from, sorry, accept is from the buyer on the channel from the buyer and transfer is on the channel from the bank. And therefore what the agent should do is not look because it wants accept before transfer, it should ignore the channel from the bank till it has received an accept. Uh, so, it is saying, you know, if a, if a message arrives on another channel, uh, because if you look, happen to look at that channel, it, mess, it may mess up your correctness. Don't look at that channel, which seems like a very odd way of uh, handling message arrivals. So here, here is will pay, want and will pay an indirect payment and trace. Now, I'll not dwell too much on this, but uh, Without FIFO, just like Scribble, Trace would not be able to encode the want and will pay protocol. That will only work if FIFO is assumed. And just like Scribble, uh, uh, Trace, uh, so somewhat differently from Scribble, Trace uh, rejects the protocol altogether, which I, I think somewhat sensibly, given, given, given the way the approach works, uh, is, as they say, because 
because the transfer may arrive before they accept, uh, it will be incompatible with the projection where the accept, which ex or the seller's projection where the accept must be observed before the transfer and therefore they reject this protocol as invalid. So they don't introduce any contortions like don't look at this channel, look at that channel and so on, uh, uh, like scribble. So, uh, so, so in any, so the conclusion is that, you know, the, the, in trace, you can't encode these, both these things, both these protocols. So if you look at the architectural, architecturally, then the BSPL approach, if, if you specify the protocol in BSPL, uh, but it, it, all it needs from the environment is, you know, an asynchronous communication infrastructure and no, no other assumptions are made. Uh, the only all, all 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 approaches will of course need the assumption that of non-creativity that the infrastructure only send deliver messages that were sent so that that's common to all but in addition to that trace requires FIFO uh, communication and uh, scribble requires not only FIFO but it has this additional channel selector component if you if you sort of uh, induce the what scribble is doing into the architecture then you know it's a telling the agent, uh, this is a channel to look at. This is a, and it's, it's going to hide the channels that might mess up the agent's computation. Uh, that, that's what the channel selector is doing. So uh, it's it's like uh, messages are arriving into your mailbox, but Scribble is saying, well, you know, uh, arriving into different mailboxes and Scribble is saying, don't look into that mailbox, even though there might be interesting things in there uh, till you have observed some other message. Now, now, I forgot to emphasize actually the most important point that in fact, uh, it might, the seller might want to see the transfer whenever it arrives, even if accept does not arrive, but because maybe transfer carries all the information that an accept would have brought it. Maybe because transfer, like in the BSPL protocol, you know, it, it has the uh, transaction ID, it has the price, it has, uh, so, so if it has a transaction ID, the the seller can figure out because it has seen an offer an offer from the uh, from from it has sent an offer to the buyer, and therefore it knows that the transfer is in response to that offer. So it can go ahead with the delivery. You know, it doesn't have to wait for an accept to come. Uh, and and in fact, transfer may well the arrival of transfer may may well set off some commitment ticking. You know, that needs to be discharged by a certain deadline. Uh, so ignoring things uh, simply to ensure protocol correctness or ignoring uh, ensuring protocol correctness by ignoring messages is not a good way to think about asynchrony or is incompatible with asynchrony rather. So here are some uh, principles for uh, protocol languages, uh, which sort of build upon the discussion earlier. So. Uh, because the, you, you might think about, you know, why, why do the languages differ? Are there something, is there something more fundamental going on? And one of those things is that uh, the session types based approaches, uh, trace and so on and, and scribble, they, they specify the protocol, the computations of a protocol from a unitary perspective. It's, it's in trace. It's, 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 it's easier to explain for trace. You know, they treat the expression as a regular expression and, so strings that satisfy that expression, you know, those are the enactments, the computations of the protocol. And then they take projections for, for the parties. And then the protocol is good if the parties projections together can compute exactly and all of those, exactly the things in, in the, pro, uh, exactly the protocol, they can reproduce the protocol computations. And you can see that occurring with, uh, in, in the flexible purchase uh, scenario uh, earlier. Where, where from, from, from the global perspective, which is this protocol over here, you know, it's a clear choice between either payment first or shipment first. Uh, and, and if payment happens first, then shipment happens later and shipment happens first, then payment happens later. Uh, but when you take the projections, it's not so simple anymore, you know, because there are send choices between sending and receiving. And that's why the things get messed up because the, the, the global the protocol computations are given from a unitary perspective and there is a protocol there's a computation here 
uh, which cannot be reproduced by the projections and the, which, which is why the deadlock, which is what the deadlock indicates. And therefore the protocol is rejected. So, so the, the BSPL by contrast does not specif specify the computations from a unitary perspective. You recall earlier, uh, you know, each agent has its own local state uh, and the correctness of, and, and the global, uh, the, the state of the protocol is this virtual thing. It's never materialized anywhere. It's just uh, a join of the, the local states of all of the agents in the system. So, uh, so, so the state is fundamentally, the state of the protocol is fundamentally in terms of the projections of the agents. So there is no such thing as a global state or a, or a, or a run from any unitary perspective. The non-interference is the idea that a protocol must not block legitimate agent reasoning. Now, uh, we saw that with Scribble, uh, that where, uh, where it blocks the agent from seeing the transfer message because it is a channel from the bank. Uh, it, is, it is blocking the seller's ability to actually process that message and go ahead with the delivery because it has received the payment. So why not go ahead with the delivery? But Scribble will block that uh, simply for purposes of ensuring whatever notion they have of correctness. And, and FIFO, is, FIFO does the same thing. So FIFO in FIFO, the infrastructure hold, holds back messages that could have been delivered uh, to the agent, but the messages will be head back, held back waiting for some other message. So uh, all, all these kinds of ordering, they, 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 they have the potential to block uh, reasoning that an agent might, might otherwise perform and therefore they interfere with uh, autonomy. Like in the want will pay example, seller could have processed will pay and gone ahead with shipping even if it had not received want, right? Because will pay may presumably has all the information in it, then why should the seller wait for want? But if you had FIFO, then uh, will pay will not be delivered to the seller until want has been delivered. So it's just an odd way of dealing with asynchrony. Then the third uh, principle for protocol languages is uh, what we call the protocol end-to-end -end argument, which is that the correct, you know, it's the protocol's job to ensure the, the, the correct occurrence of events, the order in which events occur in the system. And uh, therefore it's not sensible to rely on the protocol for, for correctness, to rely on the infrastructure, to rely on message ordering guarantees from the infrastructure. Since the appropriate constraints in fact have to be implemented and checked in the agents themselves. And as indirect payment illustrates, uh, FIFO is inadequate because uh, even with FIFO, things get messed up. And if you assumed ordering from the infrastructure, that may also turn out to be excessive. So here's an example which shows that FIFO ordering, if you ran protocols, enacted protocol, if agents enacted protocols and infrastructure that had FIFO ordering, it, what would happen is that unrelated messages that from, dif from different protocols that have absolutely no, uh, no consequence for one another, uh, for, for each other would, would, would end up getting ordered by FIFO, right? So, so here's a, here are two protocols, you know, just very so, sort of simplistic examples. Just want, uh, in the just want protocol, buyer sends a want message to the seller. And there's a hello world protocol from, in which the buyer sends a greeting to the seller. Now, there is no reason for these uh, messages to be ordered. If you look at the information they're producing, there's no relation. Want is producing ID and item and greeting is producing GID and utterance. There is absolutely no dependency between them, no meaningful dependency between them. But if you had FIFO infrastructure, even these would get ordered by the infrastructure. So illustrating that you know, uh, uh, FIFO, or that they're ordering infrastructure may be excessive. So, to summarize, you know, assuming ordering from the infrastructure is not only inadequate, it may also turn out to be excessive. So implement whatever you want inside the agents rather than uh, relying on the infrastructure. So to summarize uh, this evaluation, here's a table, uh, you know, trade is concurrency is supposed to be uh, 
the big argument behind session types that it's a new way of looking at concurrency. But uh, in fact, you, you cannot express concurrent enactments in, in these approaches. Uh, these approaches are also not compatible with asynchrony. They can't handle, or, or they're not as compatible with, not, not fully, they don't really embrace as, asynchrony because they require ordering assumptions. And every time you make an assumption like that, what you're doing is hiding synchronization in the infrastructure. Uh, they, 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 they can handle instances which I haven't gone into much in a limited manner because you can do recursion and so on and therefore repeat the protocol. But, you, you, but the thing with instances is that uh, you can have many instances of the same protocol uh, being enacted concurrently. So I can have a transaction with a seller for figs and a transaction with the seller for jam, both running concurrently with, uh, with the messages from both the enactments interleaved, both the instances interleaved. And so, such enactments would not be supported in trace and scribble. Uh, they, they obviously don't support integrity so that, uh, because they don't model information. And, and, and the, actually the session types work had, they're addressing an important problem that, uh, you know, we should get away from shared memory and so on and, and coordinate via protocols. But what has happened is that along with the shared memory, the notion of the object that was important in the shared memory that, you know, that there are processes here hitting a shared object. That object itself has gone out. Uh, so there is no model of the information uh, as in BSPL. What BSPL does is that it gives you a way of computing a decentralized object. The protocol is, uh, is, is, a, is a method for computing a decentralized object. So you don't have shared memory, but you're still computing objects. And that notion, because that notion of object is not there, uh, that that makes that is a fundamental problem with uh, with approaches such as session types and trace and so on. Uh, then of course, if if you if you don't have the notion of an object, you can't compute norms on top of them. Uh, they don't support trace and scribble. Don't support extensibility either, uh, which is just I think an artifact of how they are formalized. Uh, they assume that the protocol is the entire universe of discourse, uh, but an agent can be enacting in many protocols. So you should not limit uh, uh, an agent's sort of state to a protocol as the universe of discourse, uh, which is what BSPL does. It, it, the universe of discourse is, is all the things that an agent can observe. Uh, also trace and scribble, well, I should say they are unitarian. So there's a typo over there, they are unitarian. Uh, meaning that they don't satisfy the non-unitarian principle. So the criterion should be unitarian and it should be the, like it says, no, no for trace and scribble. Uh, again, uh, the criterion should be interference. There's a typo over there. Scra scra trace and scribble by holding back messages from the agent, they interfere with agent reasoning and autonomy and trace and scribble uh, also don't support, uh, they don't satisfy the protocol end-to-end -end principle because they rely on infrastructure assumptions. So BSPL satisfies, uh, satisfies all of these criteria. In fact, uh, it can uh, express, uh, so it is less demanding. Uh, in, in one way to think about it is less demanding and yet it can, it's less demanding of the environment of what it needs to work correctly. And yet it can express uh, uh, a larger variety of protocols. So let me stop. Uh, what do you want yeah, to... yeah, let me take over from here until uh, uh, through the blockchain discussion, then maybe you can resume from IoT. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I have to share my screen. Do you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so we are back, uh, I'm back again, and I'm, I'll talk about some applications of meanings and protocols. Uh, we have uh, three on the agenda here, the one on blockchain, one dealing with uh, IoT, Internet of thing, app, Things applications, and uh, the third one dealing with uh, microservices, as in uh, the function as a service, sort of cloud computing style, uh, um, style delivery of services. So I'll begin with the, uh, the most substantial of these discussions, which is on uh, the blockchain and then 
I mean, it will continue from the IoT and the FAS. So, so you know, uh, I guess you all heard of blockchain as a uh, as a way to maintain the ledger that is. Uh, 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 depending on how they phrase it, they might say it's immutable. Uh, it's not technically immutable, but close enough for practical purposes. And in addition, uh, this blockchain ledger can be used as a basis for uh, for recording and carrying out. Uh, uh, smart contracts. So smart contracts in this case are are essentially just uh, programs, you know, bits of code. They sometimes call chain code uh, because they reside on the blockchain, and uh, they are signed by the parties involved, uh, st stored on the blockchain, and they are kind of auto turned on. In in that uh, the code is the, the code is on the blockchain and it's it's uh, you know waiting for some events to occur, and when those events occur, the code uh, executes. So, so these events would be the inputs. And one example of it could be, uh, for example, like you know, we could say uh, if the price, so the exchange rate of U.S. dollars and um, and uh, Japanese yen changes to this much, then I will transfer you know so much to you. You know, so much, take some action like that, transfer some funds to you. So you could have things like that. You could build in um, uh, purchases and so forth. Uh, People have uh, developed applications involving, for example, access to a house uh, where the where the sensors are linked to the blockchain. Now, um, th there are some challenges with linking external entities, so but 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 anyway, that is the conception. So we'll talk about that. The other thing here is that the smart contract is meant to be uh, it's a, a smart contract is fully automated, so it's guaranteed to run when something happens. There isn't a uh, there isn't a choice for you to stop it, and that's why we call it, you know, the doomsday machine. In reference to the uh, the movie about, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name, the famous movie from the 1960s about, um, uh, you know, with Peter Sellers. So we have um, some other uses of block. Uh, smart contracts are pretty standard or pretty, you know, more believable. So one of them is Bitcoin transactions on Bitcoin. You know, if you uh, if you try to make uh, transfers on bitcoins, it has to verify that you have uh, the requisite uh, uh, coins, kind kind of, because it has to trace down the uh, the ledger to uh, uh, to be able to verify that the new transaction would succeed. Now, bitcoin is one of those cases with the smart contracts. I would say do work. And just to look ahead, I mean, the main thing is that in the, in the case of bitcoin, the the inputs and the effects of the smart contract are entirely within the uh, the, the blockchain mechanism. So, so, in other words, the blockchain mechanism mechanism can make sure that the the smart contract executes precisely. And of course, the purpose of the the Bitcoin transact, uh, transactions is uh, the transfers and so on is uh, uh, when it's stated precisely, like the you know expanding bit uh, expanding. Uh, uh, Bitcoins and so on. That, all of that is specified precisely, and it's implemented inside the blockchain. Uh, when the contract has to execute, it does succeed because the coins that it is transferring are in the blockchain. So there's no external effect. Now there are. There's also a notion of blockchain, which is much more exciting to people. Is uh, which is looking at uh, other architectures for blockchain. Like um, one of them is Ethereum. Uh, there's R3 Corda, which is a, a, a an industry effort in the US, I guess, supported by many of the banks and so on. Ethereum is the more uh, libertarian style effort, I think, housed out of uh, uh, Switzerland. Um, so anyway, so in these in these general purpose platforms, when they talk about smart contracts, the, they also expand the language, the programming language in which the smart contracts are expressed. So they make the smart contracts um, you know the language Turing complete and the smart contracts therefore you know in general difficult or impossible i should say to uh, to verify the correctness of so this picture uh, illustrates a sort of a conceptual view of the traditional architecture of uh, uh, of a smart contract system so we assume that there are you know there's some participants to the contract or to the blockchain there's the blockchain itself which is this big thing in the middle and then what we call the devices at the bottom so the devices could be uh, external sensors they could be they could even be computers or browsers or whatever right so they are they are, they are computational entities the participants are the social entities the presumption is that the participants uh, control these devices you know like um, enter an event through um, through their 
uh, could be the calendar, could be their um, the thermostat in the house and so on, uh, you know, the actual physical devices. So what, what's going on is that uh, at the top here, we have uh, the participants have agreed to or somehow introduce a smart contract, let's say they signed off on it. And the smart contract reflects the agreement that the participants have with each other. So as, the, the, as things happen, the devices generate uh, events. So there's a smart contract here, which might check the uh, the events being valid. Like you might you might do some elementary checks, like maybe um, like the exchange rates are you know positive numbers or something. You know, or or you could check some other properties of them. So as as soon as those events are validated to that basic level, they get added to the blockchain. And when they're added to the blockchain, that would trigger any smart contract for which. Uh, those events are significant, which those events are relevant. So when the smart contract is triggered, the smart contract executes and it generates some events which are also recorded on the blockchain. So this is the important step that we shown, shown right here. So there could be a, a, a smart contract that you and I have, maybe like a, a bet that I bet you that uh, if you can ever get more than, uh, you know, 200 yen for one US dollar, I'll give you a million pounds. And some events happen. So we had, let's say, already decided, you know, where we were going to receive these events from, say, some exchange rate uh, provider. The information comes in, comes in. It's validated at the at the basic level. It gets recorded. So now we know that the, let's say, in this in this example, the Japanese yen is a, um, I said 200. So maybe this is 201. You know, it's above that threshold. Uh, the smart contract immediately fires, and therefore, it what it does is it transfers my million dollars into your account. So it's already done that transfer or my, my million Bitcoins into your uh, your Bitcoin. So it's it's doing that execution um, automatically. Now, if it turns out that there was an error in the in the smart contract, uh, there would be no recourse for me because the smart contract is is on the blockchain. I can't just go in and uh, edit it because it's you know quote unquote uh, immutable. Uh, if I change my mind, if I say, well, you know, I signed the contract, but I'm going to Violate it, so you can come. You know, you can come sue me, but you know, I'm going to violate the contract. Well, I don't have a choice anymore because the smart contract uh, is going to execute. So, in a way, what the smart contract has done is it's it's fully automated uh, the social relationship. It's taken away the autonomy of the participants. It's also taken away their accountability because there's nothing to account for anymore, uh, and it'll just execute by itself. Now, there are some. Um, some broader technical limitations with this kind of an approach. Maybe I'll, I'll just describe them briefly. One of them is that just linking up to the external world is not as easy as you know people might imagine. That maybe if there are external sensors, some of the sensors will break or they'll give uh, erroneous information. If that happens, the smart contract will you know, potentially still execute when it sh should not, or fail to execute when it should, and therefore there would be a discrepancy between what is being recorded as an as a uh, immutable event on the blockchain with what's real. So the reality and the and the blockchain will go out of sync because uh, our knowledge of the reality is uh, is limited in some ways. And for some other transactions, it's also a bit odd. Like if I wanted to transfer to you a million dollars, um, and then the smart contract had to guarantee that it could transfer a million dollars, that means the smart contract should have controlled those million dollars from the outset, right? It should have known. Uh, it should have. It should have a hold on those million dollars already. So in other words, I can't just uh, write a contract today, uh, you know, like I, I, like if I wanted to buy a house saying that I'll pay, you know, $1,000 a month for 30 years, well, the smart contract can't guarantee it uh, until it has all the money at once, right? How does it know I will have $1,000, you know, uh, 23 years after I make the purchase? Well, it doesn't know until it actually has the money in hand. But if it has all the money in hand, then, you know, why do we want to uh, wait you know, if I really had the money that I could give to the smart contract, and maybe I would just be as well, just you, you know, give the money and pay off the, you know, pay off the loan, buy the buy the house outright. So maybe there. So in other words, there's some expectation that there may be some other thing. Maybe there's a more complex uh, economy that we are setting up that's under the control of the smart contract. But um, uh, but if that as as long as that's a, that's not a viable assumption, uh, you know, without putting the entire entire world economy into the control of the blockchain or the same blockchain. Uh, that's not quite a viable uh, endpoint. But the more practical concern is that it also violates autonomy that we can't really have these parties. They don't, they no longer have the choice to violate a contract. Whereas in real life, people enter into contracts, they discover 
not only that there are environmental problems, but that maybe there are some other uh, operating conditions that they face that are different, which leads them to to violate those constraints, uh, to those contracts. So that's taken away. So I, I just take this elaborate sort of long-winded example, just to point out that uh, this kind of a mechanism that focuses on automation is not appropriate as a basis for programming for autonomy. And the other, I think I mostly covered these kinds of examples. There's one, ex one uh, situation, there's one example I want to bring up. So a few years ago, there was a situation with Ethereum where they set up a, what they call a decentralized autonomous organization. And uh, it wasn't entirely autonomous, it was more an automated kind of a thing. But they had made a mistake in their smart contract. So these people who participated in it, it was like meant to be a venture capital raising kind of a thing, but they had made a mistake in their, con in their uh, in the, or rather there was a mistake in the virtual machine that was executing the contract language. What happened was that if it hit an exception, uh, it would just uh, end the transaction. So, you know, if it was something like I had to take out, you know, one coin from my account and put it to, into your account, normally we expect that when you take out the money and you add the money, they both happen simultaneously. And I think in this case, what was going on was that the money was being added to somebody's account without being taken out and that was because after the money had been added there was a the stack the the virtual machine had a stack overflow or something and it just simply didn't handle the other part of the transaction so it completed only half a transaction but it made it immutable and so that was that was a disaster but the important thing there is that there was a social response the social response was that the people could decide that they would uh, fork the the chain as, as in in the parlance. What it means is, uh, let's say from you know June tenth, uh, you know bad things started happening, and today is June sixteenth. So for six days, bad things have happened. We can either live live with these bad th bad things, or what we can do is we can go back to the chain as it was on uh, the tenth of June, and we can just start to say we'll we'll say that all of us will accept that as the as the main the re as reality. And from the 10th of June, we'll start doing events again. So we'll simply skip everything that happened uh, from the 10th of June to the 16th of June. This is called forking a change because you're going back and running reality on a different path. Of course, that's a disaster because uh, if it was a, you know, you can't undo, you can undo only these purely, uh, you know, money moving in kinds of transactions that are inside the blockchain, but you can't undo other things. Like if you had, you know, physically uh, uh, consumed some resources, you can't unconsume them and so on. So, so instead, what we propose is the idea that we should think of contracts directly. So contracts are the ultimate sort of representation of autonomy. So we should provide a computational basis for supporting them. Or at least contracts are good enough. I mean, there are more elements to autonomy, like model autonomy and so on. But at the very outset for programming this typical applications, uh, contracts would be the way to handle them. Now, typically in, in programming languages, people use the word contracts, like uh, I think Bethram Meyer and other people do that. But what they really mean there is not a contract. What they mean is like a fixed set of constraints. Like they'll say something like uh, the stack has a contract that if you put an item on it and then you pop the item, you get the same item, right? You push and pop and the pop should return the item you last pushed. Uh, to us, that's not a real contract because again, it's automation. It, it cannot be violated. Like the stack can't say, you know, sorry, I don't feel like giving you the top uh, item anymore. Uh, whereas a real autonomous agent could, you know, you could have a contract for somebody to do something and they may decide not to. Now, um, the fact is, you know, computer scientists sometimes think that, you know, violation is a bad thing, but violation is not generally bad because it's, it indicates freedom. It also indicates that there's a possibility for expanding the um, the scope of the program because when you apply it in real life, there'll be many reasons that justify a violation that you hadn't thought about before. So you make that all possible, but also you make it possible for um, well, not just the parties individually, but the parties collectively to be adaptive by being able to violate uh, these these uh, uh, contracts. So, so instead of what we have is a notion that the contract can be violated, but we still want to use a blockchain as a way to record those, uh, those violations. So the architecture we propose is, is somewhat like this. So we still have participants like before, we still have devices like before, devices do generate events like before, they're verified and recorded like before. So everything is the same. What's different is uh, two things are going on. One is that instead of a smart contract, we now have a viable contract, uh, which we store on the blockchain and uh, we have a mechanism for evaluating this contract. So this would be like, 
figuring out something analogous to the, uh, in fact, in our implementation, it is exactly the, uh, uh, the, the code that you would use to evaluate if a commitment was uh, discharged or detached or expired and, or, and so forth. So what happens is you specify the particular commitments and norms here, uh, events happen, the evaluator looks at the no norms that you specify, looks at the events that have occurred and say, oh yeah, looks like, you know, this, uh, you had a, here you had a commitment um, to provide some goods if there was a payment, here a payment has occurred so it tells you, he says, hey, no, go, you know, you're not supposed to provide the, deliver the goods that you had promised. And now you might decide not to do it, in which case you're a violator and you might be, and that would be in a way an event, the non-occurrence would be an event that would eventually be recorded like time would pass, you know, so you didn't supply them in 10 days. So on the 11th day, the contract could say they can sue you for something or they can take away something else and that will take place. Or you might, you know, if in a typical situation, you would in fact comply and so everything will work smoothly, but you always retain this choice. So the decision is given to the participant, whereas in the traditional approach, it's not. So just to contrast here, there is no declarative representation. The thing itself, uh, uh, the smart contract itself is the agreement and it makes changes to the blockchain. Here, the, the, the norms are up here separately declaratively and nothing updates the blockchain uh, directly. It gives it to the participants who decides what to do. So we are taking away uh, the automation while still benefiting from the uh, the quote unquote immutability of the blockchain while still benefiting from you know computing and and so forth. And given that there are you know we can look at other things like if we, we make a three way contrast. So if you think of traditional contracts like written in natural language, we think of smart contracts like in uh, we just talked about, and we look at compacts, which is uh, the norms based approach that we uh, we described. So you can say that these are pure text, these are procedures, these are declarative. Um, they have no automation. So you know, in, in, if you work with la natural language, these guys are automated, but here we have automation, but only limited to the compliance checking, not to the actual acting. So here the, the main party, the human, the principal has a control, here they don't. And here again, the human has the control. So in a way with this approach, we're trying to find this, uh, I take advantage of uh, computer science, computing without getting, without, while also retaining the flexibility of the traditional approach. So that's the, the, the nutshell. Uh, here, of course, everything is outside. Here is everything is inside the blockchain. Here is recorded on the blockchain, but the decisions are outside. Um, here, the trust model is hard coded. Uh, here is purely between people. And here we made it explicit as to, you know, what, what are you relying on? The, the norms tell you what you trust the other body to do. Uh, which also represents the social meaning in the formal way, uh, the correctness and provide the correctness standard in the formal way. And so we say, well, this is purely social, this is purely technical, and this is uh, social technical. So with that, let me stop and turn it over to Amit to take us, uh, I guess, all the way to the end, maybe in the next 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, thanks, Manandar. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Another, do you see my slide? Oh, yeah, I can see your slides. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so so Murinder explained uh, one one domain where we've applied uh, uh, the stuff you've been talking about earlier, no, uh, specifically norms in this case. Uh, and and we actually have an implementation, a working implementation on R three code of of our, of, of uh, Compax. Uh, but we we've also built other. So that was about norms, but we also implemented protocols uh, on various kinds of uh, for various kinds of settings. So we we, we implemented a programming model uh, for building uh, for for building agents given protocol specifications in Java, and we took uh, that was published in the workshop, and we took some of the ideas over there and we applied them to. IoT uh, uh, programming models. And one of the most popular IoT program programming models is uh, Node-RED, uh, where you specify an IoT application as an orchestration. Essentially, uh, an or you can think of an orchestration as specifying a number of flows 
each starting with a sensor and uh, going through various processing steps, like it shows in the figure over here. So uh, the figure shows uh, uh, inputs coming in from two MQTT channels labeled and wrapped. And there's a join node that joins events coming from those channels and the pack node that does some processing. This is the implementation of a packer agent. It, it relates to the uh, to a order fulfillment scenario that we had modeled. And it results in a message being sent by the packer out on, an, um, uh, out on some MQTT uh, topic. So, uh, so this, is, this is how you specify an application node read, well, one uh, uh, a set of such flows. And which, which is uh, interesting because uh, if you think about most IoT applications, they are fund, they are the, the most interesting ones, at least the ones that sort of inspire the whole field, the vision of IoT uh, involve uh, multiple autonomous parties. Uh, if you think of a smart health, uh, a wearable based health scenario, then the, the, there are there is the person uh, with the wearables whose information is going perhaps into uh, a cloud uh, which is which is provided by somebody else, and then the person can give consent uh, to that provider to release the information to uh, other other uh, to third parties such as healthcare providers and uh, fitness trainers and family or for research and so on. So, so there are, that's, that's an example that shows there are multiple parties involved in this IoT application. Uh, if you talk about maintaining bridges, then the sensors could, on the bridge could be owned by, by the local government. Could be owned by by by, by the by the local authority or the city, or and information from those sensors might be going to a maintenance company that evaluates the information to take some action. Uh, so, if you think about most IoT applications, the most interesting ones uh, they they involve multiple autonomous parties, interactions between them. What the sensors uh, and the other so devices do is they, they f facilitate gathering sort of fine grained information about the environment and uh, more responsive action. But, but, but if you want to model the application as a whole, you have to model the inf information flows between the parties, the communication between the parties. And IoT programming models such as Node-RED, uh, which are based on orchestration, uh, are ill-suited to capturing decentralization because the notion of an orchestration is inherently uh, centralized uh, it is there is an orchestrator in an orchestration that executes uh, in this case uh, as shown in the figure the various nodes uh, the various processing elements and take some action so so if you want to build an iot application a decentralized iot application using node red what would what what would uh, the architecture you would get is the architecture shown uh, in the bottom part of the slide the figure that you design one end, uh, endpoint, uh, one application as a Node-RED application says by specifying the information flows uh, and another party would satisfy, uh, specify its own Node-RED endpoint. And uh, in the absence of any representation of the decentralized application itself, uh, uh, any high level specification, what would happen is for these two endpoints to interoperate uh, the, the the two parties would have to communicate their designs, their message formats, and all, all kinds of things, and uh, the communication constraints. But the result that these two endpoint implementations would become tightly coupled, uh, which is which is not highly desirable. Uh, what you want to be able to do instead is specify the communications uh, in the form of a protocol and let each uh, party develop its own endpoint based off the communication protocol. So that is what we implemented. We implemented a programming model in Node-RED uh, based off uh, protocols specified in our case in, in BSPL. So, so we didn't talk much about LOST, but LOST is this uh, local state transfer style. The idea is that each agent has local state, uh, which uh, consists of uh, the messages, the observations it has meant, messages it has sent and received. And what the agent does is enacts the local state. It, it uh, when it wants to send a message, it updates the local state and then sends it across. So you can think of it as transferring transferring local state to, to the other agents. So we realized what we did was essentially implemented BSPL 
in Node-RED uh, by using it, it in, in terms of the lost architecture. And the figure shows how, uh, is, is a specialization of the of a figure you've seen earlier, where the agents communicate on the basis of a protocol There's a pro protocol adapter that ensures correctness and that supports pro the programming model that supports uh, each agent uh, or each party to develop its agent by plugging it plugging in its decision-making policies into the adapter. So for example, uh, if an agent wants to send a message, what it can do is check with the adapter if that message is legal to send given the local state. If the adapter says, uh, and if it is legal, the adapter will then go ahead and uh, uh, update the local state and send it out on the infrastructure across to the other agent. So, uh, so, the, so there are many interesting aspects uh, we, uh, we uncovered uh, in, in, or implemented in, in this uh, exercise. And one of the things we did was in keeping with the IoT setting, we implemented the communication over UDP. BSPL, as uh, we, we discussed earlier, does not require ordered uh, delivery. So we, we said, why not implement the, why not use UDP uh, as a communication mechanism? So the messages are going out over UDP. and uh, now, UDP is a lossy uh, mechanism. Messages may get lost. There is no uh, deli uh, guaranteed delivery of messages. So, what 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 happens in what people normally do is assume TCP, and uh, that's what uh, MQTT does. It runs over TCP, and TCP handles uh, the message loss by doing retries and so on. Uh, now, what since we are running over UDP, we uh, we, of course, don't have the benefit of uh, TCP, uh, of retry in the infrastructure. So we implemented the retries in the agent itself, uh, in the agents itself. So, so here's a flow uh, at the bottom, in the bottom half of the slide, there's a flow which shows how this works. So this is the, uh, so in this scenario, there are, there are four parties. There's a merchant, there's a who's uh, receiving purchase orders from the customer. And for each purchase order, it's telling the telling a labeler to produce the shipment label and telling a wrapper to wrap each item in the uh, in the purchase order. Uh, when the wrapper is done and the labeler, when they are done, they each tell a packer uh, that the label is ready in the case of the uh, labeler. And the wrapper tells the packer that, the merch, uh, that an item has been wrapped. And the packer then puts them into boxes and ships them off. Uh, so, and, and notifies the merchant that it has been done, that the item has been handled. So, so this is showing the packer's flow. Uh, and what the packer is doing is that it has an incoming, it's re reading things from UDP, from over UDP. Uh, it is uh, checking whether the packer, whether the incoming message is legal according to the protocol, it's, whether it satisfies integrity. Uh, if it is, legal, uh, it can do two things. Uh, one is if it has already observed the message, uh, it, it assumes that uh, the message has been observed again because the sending party did not perhaps get a response, uh, the, uh, uh, did not expect, did not get a message it was expecting to receive and therefore it had resend the message. So the packer assumes that that's why that's what's happening and therefore it resends, uh, it, it goes to the reset resend path where it checks whether the me message is legal to send and, uh, sorry, uh, let me explain uh, this clearly. So it, if, if it sees a message that it has already received, then it figures out what message it should send in response to, uh, to that message it has already seen. If that message has already been sent, then the packer will uh, extract it from its history. It, it knows from its history what message it has sent and it'll just retransmit that message. Remember in BSPL retransmissions are allowed uh, because we, we, we care about the information state. Uh, and if it, has not re, if it has not already sent that message, it goes to the pack items path where it actually packs the items and then uh, uh, sends the message out uh, corresponding to the item being packed. So, so if it, the, the agent is sort of modular, in four layers, you can think of the incoming layer out of it. The check packer incoming is part of the protocol adapter. It is auto-generated. Uh, the message reasoning is 
the agent's own decision making. It plugs that. Uh, the agent designer plugs that in. The retry policy is also kind of the agent's decision making, what it wants to do with messages that it has, uh, it is seeing again from other parties. And uh, so th that is a that is the uh, that is a way of mitigating message loss uh, in this architecture. And the outgoing layer uh, is uh, the blue part. The blue node is part of the adapter, which checks that any outgoing message. Uh, con conforms uh, with the protocol is in compliance with the protocol. If so, it is then sent out onto the onto over UDP to the whichever party the message is going to. In this case, it will be the merchant. So, uh, so you get a modular agent design with several components generated. All uh, the de agent developer has to do is plug in the decision making policies, and every agent developer does it independently for the party for whom the developer is developing the agent. Uh, so, so you get a uh, you get a system uh, where the agents are coupled only by the protocol, no more, no less, and uh, that's the extent of the coupling. And and you can uh, the interesting thing we observed here was that uh, so we did ran some experiments. So how does our retry mechanism at the agent level compare with uh, MQTT over TCP? Because TCP does the retries and MQTT is the popular IoT uh, protocol. So we, we, we compared performance, how many transactions complete? What is the throughput? And we found that uh, our retry, uh, retrying over UDP in the agent actually is comparable in performance to NQTT over TCP. So it's give, giving some evidence, some pre preliminary evidence. There's much more work to be done, fine tuning in the experiments and so on, but there is some preliminary evidence that uh, retrying uh, implementing retransmissions and in generally other fault tolerance mechanisms inside the agent uh, is not as bad in terms of performance uh, as uh, people might think. Uh, people have people assume that the infrastructure, infrastructure like MQTT and TCP, like people will have spent a lot of time optimizing it, which is true and so on. Therefore, anything that uh, is that is uh, developed. Any mechanism developed at the application level will not compare in performance, but that is an argue, that is an argument that has to be uh, revisited. Uh, we think. And then uh, we also re very recently we've done another interesting exercise. We've, we've uh, tried to build. Uh, we've uh, deployed protocols on fast platforms. So fast is function as a service. Uh, in this case, in our case, we use Amazon's Lambda, and the promise of FAST is that uh, Amazon, uh, the platform manages uh, concurrency by launching as many instances of a function as needed uh, to handle incoming events, and you pay uh, and you pay for pay as you go. You know, for the uh, as 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 the application owner, you pay only for the resources that you use. So. What 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 we did was uh, uh, model or uh, we carried out an exercise in building decentralized applications. Fast, obviously, fast is too low level uh, to build a decentralized application. You need a protocol to express uh, the decentralization first. And we carried out an exercise in 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 uh, that is conceptually similar to the IoT exercise that we we came up with an adapter that. Uh, adapter-based framework that could be used to develop agents. But what is interesting about uh, this particular implementation, the FAST implementation, is that uh, we were able to split up the adapter uh, or the entire thing that we sort of generate, that we provide to the agent developer uh, as, as, as sort of out of the box based on the protocol into, into uh, several components that could run independently, here the components being functions. So many functions that could run independently. Uh, so for example, uh, the, the agent has a checker, which is basically plays the role of the adapter. It checks incoming and outgoing messages. Uh, and, but it's not the adapter that actually uh, does the job of emitting and receiving the messages. Those are split up into separate functions, receiver and emitter. So you could have, uh, many emitters running in concurrently in an agent, each emitting one message. So for every message that needs to be emitted, uh, you could have an emitter running. So 
uh, if an adapter is fast enough, then it, there'll be many messages waiting for emission. And we observe that, in fact, there are many instances of the emitter running uh, for inside an agent. And, and there can be many receivers running concurrently because there is all these uh, components shown in the figure of functions in the, in the fast sense, uh, stateless event-driven functions. And uh, it supports a programming model where uh, consisting of proactors and reactors. So the, uh, the think of the proactor as uh, the, the business logic that produces, uh, that initiates enactments. And these would be uh, the logic that produces the bindings of the keys, because that, that is by enact. You can think of the bindings of the keys as instantiating or beginning the enactment. So, so the, the business logic for some business logic would go there, the proactive business logic would go there. And then there are the reactors, which, uh, which encode business logic about uh, handling messages that are received within an, an, an enactment. So for example, in, in, in our example, uh, the merchant initiates uh, the transaction by producing, uh, by producing item IDs and uh, transaction IDs and so on. So the merchant is the only agent that has the proactors. It sends off messages to the labeler and the uh, wrapper. Now the wrapper works with the sort of the within the scope of the transaction of the merchant. So it only has reactors. It has a reactor for uh, receiving uh, a wrapping request from the merchant, uh, and the likewise the labeler has a reactor for uh, handling a, a label request, labeling request from the merchant. So. So what, what, we, what we get here is a nice modular agent structure that we support uh, by, by generating the, the appropriate code. All the, agent, all the agent developer has to do is plug in the business logic in the proactors and the reactors. And, and the benefit is that with protocols, if you combine protocols with FAS, you get highly modular and concurrent and therefore scalable, that scalability being the promise of FAS agents. Such, such agents out of the fox and let's develop a focus on the business logic. So let's uh, quickly review some of the key points uh, in, in this tutorial. So again, uh, there are many meanings of the word autonomy. The most prevalent one, uh, which, which relates to AI is the notion of an atomic uh, autonomous system uh, where autonomy refers to intelligence and automation. And uh, that is one sense of the meaning, but the, but the meaning that we are more interested in aware is that there are autonomous parties in the world. And when you have autonomous parties like humans, organizations and so on, how do you build a system that spans autonomous parties? And the key thing to realize is that any such system is decentralized. Autonomy means decentralization, interacting at arm's length, engaging on the basis of norms and in, uh, protocols and so on. Uh, now a single machine, uh, even if it is distributed, cannot model uh, decentralization. I think uh, uh, Stuart Gebby raised a question on Slack about data flow and so on. My understanding of data flow is that it can be used to specify a machine. But again, we are not talking about a single machine. Uh, my screen sharing is paused. Why is that paused? Sorry, let me just. Yeah, so. Uh, so, so I, I don't think a single data flow would be able to capture decentralization uh, because we have autonomous parties and each party is deploying a machine. The machines are communicating, and and uh, although one machine, you know, in the in the sense of the principle of the machine having an expectation has an expectation of the other agent, the uh, other machines, the other machines might not live up to those expectations. That's what autonomy means, and, and I don't think data flow or data flow model. Uh, as, as people have studied would capture that. Uh, and decentralization model requires modeling interactions. Uh, and one of the things we've been emphasizing in our work is that to model the interactions, you must cap start with the meaning of interaction. And that is where expectations and norms as capture modeling those expectations come in. In computing, we don't, in, uh, in most of computing research, 
the norms are left out. Uh, the, of course, in multi-agent systems, there's work on uh, on norms, on representing norms, and so on. But but more widely, they are left out. In practice, they are not considered. Uh, uh, representing norms is not considered at all. Uh, they're left in documents such as contracts and so on. But if you want to actually build a decentralized system, you must represent the norms. Uh, they're crucial to modeling agreements and the support to compliance checking, trust, uh, and accountability. And once you have the norms, then you have to think about operationalizing them over protocols uh, because there is no central place where immense events are coming in and the norms are being computed, the states of the norms are being computed. Each uh, party each, uh, has its own local state, has its own state, uh, and they're interacting in arm length. So the parties have to compute the states of the norms independently, and they have to do it. So you need protocols so that they compute the norms in a consistent, uh, coherent manner. Protocols must not uh, rely on ordering guarantees from the infrastructure because that's just a way of hiding synchronization in the infrastructure. Uh, if you want asynchrony, you have to go, you know, kind of full Monty or whatever. Uh, uh, it, so the question you have to ask is, can the protocol work over UDP? Uh, you have to go all the way. Uh, protocols must uh, specify information causality and not a control flow of messages. Uh, this relates to the other point that, you know, we, a protocol has to specify the computation of a decentralized object. We can't think purely in terms of message names and leave out the information being computed because uh, that the, that's the more interesting part, uh, the information. And uh, once you have information, you, have, you can specify the protocol in terms of the information constraints, the causality and integrity of that information. Uh, if 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 you're developing, if you're doing research on on you know co in, on coordinating uh, different uh, co coordinating processes or agents, if if in a if in a work your recept if if you require that a reception must happen in a certain order relative to other receptions and emissions, uh, then you have not fully embraced asynchrony because remember as we talked as we discussed earlier. Uh, uh, receptions are non-deterministic. A reception happens when the infrastructure delivers the message. If you choose to schedule a reception relative to other observations, uh, then things are likely to get messed up. Uh, don't, uh, the next one says, don't imp imp impose models that interfere with agent autonomy. Again, this goes to the point that for purposes of correctness, you may think that you need an uh, ordering guarantee from the infrastructure uh, but when you do that, uh, then you're interfering with agent autonomy and autonomy uh, is sacred. Don't interfere with autonomy. Uh, if you design the protocol correctly, like uh, with information protocols, then you won't need the ordering guarantee from the infrastructure and you won't interfere with autonomy. And it's worth thinking about the end-to-end -end principle. It's a, it's, a, it's a great principle and we should think about apl applying it uh, in, at the application. Uh, for in, in our applications. So like, like I talked a little bit about retransmissions, but in general, there's the idea of fault tolerance and people uh, tend to think that these are things that have to be handled by the infrastructure. The agent, uh, it, it, they should not be handled at the application level because they're complicated uh, or the implementation will be inefficient. So leave it to the smart people. Uh, but I think uh, uh, we have to rethink uh, this whole premise with protocols, uh, you, you, uh, with the with the adapters and so on, you, there's an opportunity to make them highly efficient. And if you think about protocols correctly, apply them correctly, then you can uh, do fault tolerance like we did with the IoT work at at the application level. So you can have the best of both worlds uh, if if you apply the end to end principle th and think about protocols, the structure your application in terms of protocols. So with, that brings us to the end of uh, sort of the content that we wanted to present. Uh, this is what we would normally do in, uh, in a face-to-face -face, uh, or in a, at a conference. Uh, I'm not sure how to do this now. Maybe you can respond on Slack if you've been listening on YouTube uh, or Zoom. Uh, 
or send question or comment on these things. Uh, we can spend a few minutes on that, if the, and we can just bring up, uh, discuss these points, whatever you bring up. So what what we we just put some questions here for to to initiate the discussion. What theme do you remember most from today? Uh, what additional themes, high level themes, should we consider within uh, software engineering program? Uh, 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 this talk has been a lot about architecture, in fact. So it relates to software engineering. It relates to programming languages because uh, it talks about specifying uh, interactions. Of course, it relates to AIs because we've been talking about multi-agent systems and distributed computing as well. So that if there are other themes that you think uh, would be relevant that we haven't considered, uh, that, that'd be good to know. And the, the bigger question is, you know, what research questions are worth pursuing with the aim of promoting a deeper understanding between interaction orientation, uh, the kind of approach and concepts and abstraction that we have discussed in this tutorial and programming languages, which for the most part has uh, uh, gone in a different direction. So, uh, so what research questions would be worth pursuing here to promote a deeper understanding? And yeah, uh, just, so Samuel Christie and Daria Spinoa, uh, uh, research assistants at Lancaster, uh, and Samuel is also a PhD student at, at, at uh, uh, NC State University, and they both contributed to uh, parts of the uh, this tutorial. And the research was funded by NSF and EPSRC. Uh, and we, we should I should mention uh, Raymond. Uh, Viviana and Angelo, and they, they, they gave a lot of feedback on uh, the evaluation that we carried out for protocol languages. Yeah, uh, I think that's uh, the end of uh, the presentation, but we can have a discussion if there are questions for the next 10 minutes, perhaps, or Munidhar, how do you want to do it? Let me, let me just check Slack. But I guess th there's no need to hang out here, I suppose. Uh, oh, sorry, I was, uh, I was on mute. Yeah, there's a question on Slack that I thought we could, we could address from uh, Stuart. Uh, it's about uh, how to verify the specification of a protocol that has been implemented in the traditional programming language and programming model. Um, and something about verifying the protocol, the runtime of the protocols have been defined and verified. Yeah, so the, the overall intuition with protocols is that they capture the interaction and uh, only the interaction. So when you specify a protocol, that document, uh, that's a like in the lesson BSPL, we would verify that it has some good properties and some of the properties we mentioned today, like uh, I, I, I think I use the name safety and liveness for them. So safety is the, is the idea that the protocol will not uh, allow a situation where, um, uh, where, where agents can end up producing uh, integrity violation. And liveness is that the protocol will not allow situations where the agents are blocked from proceeding uh, to completion. You know, assuming, and there are assumptions, you know, that for behind these properties that the the infrastructure keeps working. But the main thing is that the protocol focuses on the interaction and it separates the the verification problem into the interaction, which which is done at the protocol time, and the the implementation of the endpoints. So if you have agents who um, so, so if you have an agent for a buy for the buyer and an agent for the seller, you would verify the buyer and the seller agent separately from each other. So the buyer agent should be able to, for example, uh, uh, produce uh, an RFQ message and produce an accept or a reject message and uh, and a payment message. The seller agent should be able to produce a price quote message and maybe a deliver message and things like that. So we can say we can say these are the capabilities that these agents have, and if they have them, then uh, uh, then they will enter, you know, and then they they actually comply with the protocol, like they don't try to violate the violate integrity 
or do or mess around with the in and out, you know, those kinds of things, uh, then they will come interoperate. So if they comply with the protocol, they are implemented to satisfy, to be able to handle the messages that they're expected to handle, then they can indeed interoperate. We can take it further usually. It's usually just sending a message without meaning is not enough. So there is, we can also model the meaning. So we can say, uh, this agent can represent the commitments it's made, the commitments that others have made to it. It can track the progress of those commitments as in, you know, what's detached, what's not. It'll, 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 so we can do we can do all of that as well. Um, so you, so the question was, so the protocol never quite shows up in the in the Java language. As, I mean, the, the protocol is, um, uh, I, I think when, when you might be seeing protocol verification, perhaps you're thinking of, verifying a particular implementation uh, using the protocol. And our claim is that we can do that modularly. So I, I, I think that might be an answer. Maybe Amit wants to add to that, I think. No, I, I think, yeah, well, what, he said, what he said sounds uh, like it should be. So there's another question about, well, that one's simple. So given packet size constraints with UDP, have you considered using CBOR rather than JSON as a message, JSON as a message representation format? Uh, we, we, we haven't, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll look at that. So right now, you know, that, that is not a parameter we were uh, varying the packet size and so on. Of course, that'll, that'll have an impact on the performance. But that, that, like I said, uh, our uh, experiments are preliminary and these things can get quite complicated. A, a protocol like TCP, which does fragmentation and so on, uh, it, it builds in a lot of uh, things into, packs in a lot of things. And so a like for like comparison is not easy to do, but, but yeah. Yeah, and one other point in, in reference, maybe uh, I mean you can switch to a slide uh, which shows a, some PSPL example. So, so one one point we can make is that when we write a message schema, we list a number of parameters in it, but there are two purposes there. You know, one is that listing the parameters tells us these uh, knowledge dependencies. So, for example, with what the thing that Amit is showing, so there's a want and a will pay. Uh, the want has ID and I. Well, yeah, thank you. ID and item. So ID and item are both uh, informative to the recipient, you know, the, for the first time. Uh, it's conceivable that uh, when, so when you have ID, item, and price the second time, if you write it the way it's written, then in a way, uh, there's a trade-off. Like we are, we are like carrying the item description the second time, right? We are, we are possibly, if it were uh, constrained like in an IoT kind of a setting, we may not want to do that. But in which case you could omit it because it is actually superfluous assuming the want message arrives. But it gives us a benefit here of maybe some fault tolerance that if the will pay arrives, then um, uh, you know it has all the information you would need for the um, uh, for the ID and the item as well. Uh, there are other considerations which you didn't mention which deal with like signatures and so on to make sure that uh, the information, like the in is actually an in, you know, or it was signed by whoever did the out. So if the, whoever produced the out value for the ID and the item uh, maybe signs it, and then later when we do an in, we are sort of quoting their value. So we're saying, uh, you know, uh, uh, Stuart declared this ID and this item, and we just use that. So there are, and those kinds of things can also play into this optimization business because uh, we can reduce packet size in some cases by uh, a message payload that is, uh, we can reduce it by not having to uh, duplicate information. This is a question. Yeah, what structural type signatures? Uh, I think in, in general, we've been thinking about how to do that because uh, there are, um, yeah, but we haven't quite figured out uh, how to do it precisely. I think the, the main thing is that um, many of the people in conventional sort of uh, uh, the type theory paradigm, they, uh, they try to 
they, they, I, it seems to us from the outside that they always they overcomplicate the picture and uh, they can't handle crossing messages, for example, but they have very subtle types. And if you go write um, uh, types out of the BSPL notation, then we might be able to demonstrate a type theoretic solution that uh, respects their, um, uh, you know, that uh, that sh shows things like safety and uh, especially safety and, and but also liveness directly. But yeah, verifying over the, the message schemas over the wire is more straightforward, I think. I think that's a more doable kind of a thing. There's, a, there's an earlier question by Stuart. Have you tried using BSPL to describe consensus protocols such as Raft? Uh, I had replied, and we, we've thought about it from time to time. I think Samuel may even have started to work on it, but we never uh, uh, got very far. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a that's a theme we yeah we discussed it not too long ago, or we thought of revisiting it not too long ago. I think Samuel tried it maybe a couple of years ago, first time around. The, do you want to comment on the data flow uh, stuff? Uh, I'm I'm less familiar with the stuff. I responded in in on the on Slack and in uh, at the end of the talk uh, because I thought uh, with the data flow you'd still capture a single machine. But Stuart is mentioning something about uh, causality in data flow and uh, yeah. Let me let me take a look at that. So I I, I think uh, yeah. So. So, so data flow machines came out maybe in the early 70s or certainly by mid 70s, they were quite prominent. There were even companies that made data flow machines. But but the, the thing there was that they were talking about how to send the data around. Um, and they were typically, if, if you send data around without regard to um, the, the kinds of notions of integrity that you, that you that we have. So they would they could design, you know, it's possible to design a data flow machine which, which works very efficiently, but then you face these race conditions about data arriving at different times. So they were meant to be uh, even realized in hardware, right, at that point. Uh, here we have the data flow intuition in that, um, you know, each party awaits, uh, sort of sits for the, you know, waits for the information that it needs. And when that information arrives in whatever order, it's immediately able to proceed. So I think that intuition, we, you could say we share with the data flow thinking, but we also make sure that we have, uh, uh, we are talking about we are using this key structure and we using uh, we are talking about this immutable structure so we're not trying to uh, revise information in addition which simplifies our situation quite a bit and i think maybe one way to think of it maybe it also refers to Stuart's other question is, is that we are interested only in interaction and many of these other languages uh, for programming and for formal even the formal modeling they capture the um, the, in, the entire application. So they capture the internal details and the communications. You know, so sometimes they would have uh, like, a, it's, it's like a more uh, homogeneous kind of a solution where, you know, you have, you're, you're writing an application which has, uh, you know, multiple parts, but you're coding up all the parts and, and their interactions and you're formalizing all the parts and their interactions. So data flow approach at that level, I think uh, didn't pan out uh, quite well. Um, for us, we are talking only about interaction. We are restricting it with our notions of um, uh, of integrity, and we are encoding the causality properties in the uh, in the interaction model. So that, I think that gives us um, it simplifies the situation and gives us clarity. Where the previous data flow approach is uh, uh, may, maybe a bit off too much.
Okay, maybe uh, we should bring the session to an end then. All right, yeah, it's, it's a good uh, a good discussion, at least with the, uh, I think it's only one person really who participated on Slack, a couple of people who participated on Slack maybe. So good, so uh, I hope, I, I think I would say, yeah, and those who are, those who are maybe silent, uh, but, but listening, uh, uh, please look at our websites, please uh, feel free to send us uh, email, our emails are pretty easy to find, maybe they're on the slides as well, and um, we can point you to the literature, and we're always seeking uh, other, you know, people who are interested in pursuing these topics, so uh, we look forward to some of it, um, some of you being attracted to some of these topics. So, uh, Amit, do you want to add something to that? Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll monitor the Slack channel uh, for the next few days. As long as the conference is going on, I think the channel will remain. So I'll monitor it. If you have any questions, you can put it there or you can uh, email it to us. And uh, yeah, we'd, we'd, if anybody wants to work on these themes, uh, we'd, we'd love that. Yeah. Thanks very much uh, for all those present. To all those present. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.